Okay, um, we should get started. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. This is Mario Machis uh, from the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. Uh, also on behalf of Matteo Galizzi from the London School of Economics, but you will hear from him uh, uh, shortly. I would like to welcome you to this uh, Johns Hopkins uh, uh, London School of Economics conference on uh, experimental insights from behavioral economics on COVID-19. Over the course of two days, uh, two half days, today and, and next Friday, we will have uh, 11 academic presentations, a panel discussion, three exciting keynote speakers. Today, uh, we will begin with our first keynote speaker, Professor Cass Sunstein, and then there will be a contributed session with four uh, speakers, uh, followed by a panel discussion. There will be short breaks between these events, but everything will be happening here on the same uh, Zoom uh, meeting. We're also very grateful to 47 scholars who sent us short five minute presentations of their work. Uh, these are available on the conference webpage and I encourage everyone to browse through the titles and, and watch what catches your, uh, uh, your attention. We have also links to the presenters web pages so you can contact them with, uh, with questions. We are very grateful to all of our presenters and to the members of the scientific committee who helped us with the, with the selection. We have a tremendous diversity of profiles, uh, topics, backgrounds, perspectives, uh, contributors from all over the world. Uh, we also have in our program university professors, postdocs, graduate students, and economists and behavioral scientists uh, from research institutes and, and think tanks. In putting together this conference, it has been really great to see how um, creative the experimental behavioral community has been in uh, Number one, thinking about ways to improve our preparedness and response to a pandemic. And number two, how much we can learn about human behavior broadly by observing and studying people during, during a pandemic. Um, we have a lot of people in attendance today. Again, welcome to all of you. This is a joint event by the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative, HBHI, and the London School of Economics Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science. I see that the director of the HBHI, Professor Dan Polsky, is here, and also Liam Delaney, Professor Liam Delaney, who is head of the Department of Psychological and Behavioral Science at LSE. Good morning, Dan and Liam. Thanks for your support. Why don't you say hi to our, to our guests? Uh, sure, I just wanna welcome everybody here to, um, I guess we have about 300 participants now to the beautiful campus of Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm Dan Polsky, director of the Business of Health Initiative. It's a new initiative uh, at the university where uh, we bring business approaches to address the gap in the U.S. between uh, uh, healthcare spending and performance. Uh, we develop platforms across the university to engage collaboration and um, disseminate uh, ideas and stimulate uh, new ideas. So. Um, just grateful to uh, have the chance to host this wonderful event and uh, really, uh, you know, just tremendous uh, kudos to Mario and Matteo for just doing a fabulous job putting this together. I can't wait for the day. Um, so thanks, thank you very much and have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Yes, just to echo uh, uh, Professor Polsky, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome everyone. I'm uh, amazed by the program that Mario and Matteo and colleagues have put together, including the keynotes and such a, a really interesting range of speakers uh, across all the different sessions. So in the department, um, we're, we're building a lot of capacity in this area and a number of our colleagues are working on COVID policies across the, across the world. And I just want to offer full support to um, should any collaborations emerge from this or any work emerge, it will certainly have the full support of the department uh, in any way that we can. And I'd just like to welcome everyone again and, and thanks again to the organizers. Super, uh, thank you again. Uh, Professor Galizzi, Matteo, you're next. Thank you, thank you Mario, Dan and Liam. Um, I'm Matteo Galizzi and it is my greatest pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Professor Cass Einstein as a, our first keynote speaker of the conference. Uh, professor Cass Einstein is uh, the Robert Worms University Professor of Harvard. He is the founder of the Behavioral Economics and Public Policy Program at Harvard uh, Law School. He chairs the uh, World Health Organization. Uh, 
Sorry. It's the uh, WHO uh, Technical Advisory Group on Behavioral Science uh, for, for Health. And uh, he was administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory uh, Affairs under the uh, Obama administration. And this week, uh, he was appointed by the Biden administration uh, to join the, Depar the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Professor Sandstein has written hundreds of articles and dozens of books, including Nudge uh, with uh, Richard Taylor. Um, here is just a selection of books uh, he has published uh, relevant on, on the topic of the conference in the current academic year since uh, September 2020. Um, too much information, understanding why, what you don't want to know, behavioral science and public policy. We seem to have lost Matteo. Professor Sunstein, okay, I'm, I I'm, will. Uh, I'm very happy to start. And one thing I think, thank you. Zoom, uh, thank you so much for having me. And I think Zoom is showing real ingenuity here because just as the title of one of my books, which is Too Much Information, was described, Zoom decided you've heard enough about his books and we're gonna stop. So Zoom, your algorithm is amazingly precise and works in real time. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers and amazed by the diversity and range and expertise of the people in this conference. And uh, it's really an honor to be able to speak with you all. Uh, what I'm going to do in this uniquely, let's say, uh, productive time for behavioral science, both in terms of research, where we're uncovering in real time uh, new things that are foundational to policy, and in terms of on the ground work, where with respect to COVID-19 and uh, poverty reduction and sex discrimination and uh, economic growth, we are seeing de developments in behavioral science which are being put to use, uh, sometimes productively. So this is the best time in world history with respect to our topic today. What I'm going to do is start by uh, accounting for relevant behavioral findings and behaviorally informed interventions in a very brisk way, just to create some uh, ground on which uh, at least I can stand or try to stand. Then to discuss a framework, we're going to call it the FEAST framework. Uh, that will be part two for understanding uh, responses to COVID-19 and maybe to health problems more generally. Then I'm going to say something more specific about vaccination acceptance and uptake with uh, uh, re close reference to the work of the World Health Organization in which I've been privileged to be involved. And then I'm going to say something general about sludge, which is administrative burdens, waiting time, uh, paperwork requirements, et cetera, and call for sludge audits. Some of these remarks will be basic, uh, meaning findings that are well, well studied and um, decades of uh, work have explored. And some of them will be frontiers issues on which we've just learned something yesterday or the day before yesterday, and on which we need to learn much more. And I'm going to try to flag the distinction between basic and frontiers. Okay, so uh, with respect to the foundations, we know that human beings are imperfect choosers. Uh, it would not be kind or accurate to say that people are irrational. Uh, they are imperfect choosers. Uh, with respect to COVID-19 and health, there are five key findings which uh, apply to some portion of the human species which are relevant to imperfect choices. Uh, one is inertia that to change from a status quo is often something that human beings are reluctant to do. We've seen a lot of overcoming of inertia in the last uh, nearly a year, but in some cases people have not moved from one state to another, even in circumstances in which that would be advantageous in terms of 
uh, health or economic incomes. Uh, human beings are prone to procrastination. That is a specification of inertia. We know that many of us show present bias in the sense that today and tomorrow really matter, the long term, not so much. With respect to COVID-19, often the future is on us. So present bias may not be as relevant as it is in other domains. Nonetheless, uh, today and tomorrow really matter keenly and that can affect decision-making. We know that human beings are frequently subject to unrealistic optimism. And there may be, by the way, good evolutionary explanations both for present bias and unrealistic optimism. If you're focused on today and you think things are gonna turn out okay, you may be able to find food or fend off the tiger. If you think I'm doomed and I'm gonna think of what of 20 years from now, you might be dead before you finish those thoughts. A problem with unrealistic optimism is it can lead people to fail to take uh, desirable precautions. We know that risk perception sometimes can go sour be because people focus on salient events which can make people exaggerate some risks and underplay others. The availability heuristic, which means what's cognitively available can often drive risk perception, can lead to systematic errors. We know also that people are loss averse, meaning a loss from the status quo looms larger, seems more upsetting than a gain from the status quo seems pleasurable, at least when people are anticipating what to do, which means that if something codes as a loss, it often triggers attention more than if it codes as a gain. If we put present bias together with inertia, unrealistic optimism, uh, imperfect risk perception and loss aversion, we can get some purchase on uh, unnecessary, let's say illness, and in tragic cases, deaths as a result of uh, the pandemic. Okay, some interventions in human behavior building on this research foundation emphasize that two sets of policies might be helpful. Let's call one set educative and another set architectural. Educative interventions, which maintain freedom of choice, might include reminders with respect to mask wearing or the availability of a vaccine, might include warnings, might include simple pr presentation of information. Those are educative. Architectural interventions might include um, default rules saying that you are presumed X unless you sp take steps to Y or might say by default, you will be enrolled in something, though you can opt out possibly, and that bears on some uh, interventions in the context of the pandemic. The data right now, the meta-analyses suggest that architectural interventions tend to be more effective than educative interventions. They might also be more costly, but on average so far, we're seeing very significant impacts from architectural interventions and statistically significant often, but not uh, powerfully uh, impressive impacts from educative interventions. To give three examples in uh, uh, domains outside of COVID-19, though they bear on the current situation of uh, architectural interventions that really help, um, when children are automatically enrolled in programs for free school meals, the participation rates are much, much higher than if the parents are asked whether they want the kids to opt in. In the United States alone, about 15 million children are now enrolled in free school meal programs. That's more effective in circumstances in which kids are actually going to school than in circumstances in which they aren't. But this is the one program I confess that if I think too hard about it, I start to cry. And so I'm not gonna think too hard about it and just give you a number, 15 million kids. Uh, we know that all over the world, automatic enrollment and savings programs, that's an architectural intervention, significantly increases participation rates. There's new data yet to be published from Switzerland showing that automatic enrollment in green energy uh, significantly increases usage of green en energy, even with easy opt-out, and even when green energy is more expensive, 
and even among small, medium-sized, and large businesses, not just households. So I want to underline the drama of that finding, which is consistent with other work in the United States and in Germany, which is if people are automatically enrolled in green energy subject to easy opt-out, the participation rate increases dramatically, even when green energy is more expensive and even when we're talking about businesses. Okay, that's background with respect to behavioral findings and with respect to uh, interventions that are choice preserving. Of course, there might be behaviorally informed interventions such as compulsory mask wearing that aren't choice preserving. Okay, now let's have a framework which is uh, based on work originally done in the United Kingdom, uh, but is going to be a little bit of a friendly amendment to the framework. The framework, let's call it FEAST, and it's an acronym. And the idea attempting to generalize from uh, decades of work in behavioral science says there are five things you do if you want to produce different behavior from what you're now observing. Uh, the E in the FEAST framework, I'm going to signal first because that's the Olympic gold member, winner. That's the Usain Bolt of behavioral interventions in the sense that it's fast and it tends to win. Uh, e means easy. And that suggests that if we want to increase, let's say, take up of economically advantageous programs for poor people, uh, to simplify requirements often generates much larger take up rates. If we can take a form that's 12 pages and turn it down to one page, the likelihood that participation will jump is really high. Of course, the extreme end of E, easy, is automaticity. And if people are automatically enrolled in a program subject to opt out, then the meta-analysis shows participation rates are, are on average 26% higher and to jump participation rates from, let's say, 25% to 51% like that, that's a uh, tremendous achievement. Uh, the Olympic silver goes to, um, I don't know how many of you follow the horse race, horse races. Secretariat was the greatest uh, race horse of all time. E, easy as Secretariat. Sham, an unfortunate name for a truly spectacular horse. Sham was second to Secretariat in the two great races. Sham could have been very famous had Secretariat not existed. The sham, meaning not the word fake, but the word really great, just second best, is the S in the feast framework, meaning social. So if people are pointed to or clarified about the existing social norm, that is likely to make the social norm a self-fulfilling prophecy. If doctors learn that the norm is not to prescribe a certain level of antibiotics, then they are more likely not to prescribe that antibiotic. And there's data supporting that finding. If people learn or internalize even through uh, their networks, that the norm in their group is to get vaccinated or the norm in their group is to engage in social distancing, then the likelihood that the percentage of people doing that thing grows is very, very high. The data is strong that identification of the social norm and publicity of the social norm can be a successful non-architectural uh, intervention. The A in the FEAST framework says attractive, if a sign is pretty or large or colorful in some pleasing way, then the likelihood that people will pay attention to it is bigger. And T refers to timely, meaning is the information being given or the architecture being vi made visible at exactly the time when people make relevant choices. So timing is everything with respect to COVID-19 interventions. If you tell people the night before they go to stores, do X and Y and Z, that's much less good than you if you tell it right at the store. Okay, I suggested the framework is going to be feast and you now have the E, automatic, uh, easy, sorry, automatic extreme case, E, easy. A, attractive, S, social, and T, timely. The F is fun. 
And the basic idea here is that much successful behavior change, including in the context of COVID-19, uh, enlists the human desire to smile and laugh as a tool in producing whatever is sought to be produced. In Taiwan, where they have been quite successful, at least at times in combating COVID-19, the basic idea is humor over rumor. And the goal has been to seek to make people, even under very difficult conditions, to think that some things that they're dealing with actually have a smile in them and possibly a wry laugh. New Zealand's success in combating COVID-19 has enlisted the F in the FEAST framework to good effect, suggesting that uh, while there's going to be a serious lockdown, at one point there was, the Easter bunny is exempted, said the prime minister, and so is the tooth fairy. So those two get exemptions, and that made people think not this is a hopeless situation where despair and fear are the order of the day, but this is a serious challenge in which New Zealanders are going to um, uh, uh, see brightness and wit and get over the problem. Now, this is uh, kind of a doubly good intervention. <coughs> Sorry, my dog, my dog is... Uh, responding enthusiastically to the F and the FEAST framework. This is doubly good because it increases welfare during the process of behavior change, so that even if it did wasn't effective, at least people would have somewhat better days, and also because it's likely to be more effective. And large companies have been onto this for the last 18 months or so, where they have used uh, something like um, positive affect as a generator of change. Okay, this is abstract. Now I'm going to get to a frontiers domain, which is vaccine uptake and acceptance and build on uh, empirical work outside of the context of COVID-19, which must be taken with a grain of salt for that reason. It's outside of the context of COVID-19, but which is also keenly informative, both about vaccine acceptance in particular and about uh, behavior change in general. So the beauty of the area involves its generalizability as well as its acute contemporary uh, urgency. Okay, there are three problems for uh, vaccination uh, promotion efforts, and they're very different, and they suggest heterogeneity in the relevant population of, let's say, less than 100% likely to get vaccinated. Problem one is inconvenience. So if we have a population of people, let's say, that are really busy, uh, really stressed, uh, not particularly educated, to get vaccinated may be hard because there's a navigation challenge that must be overcome. Uh, even for people who don't suffer from low levels of resources and little education, the issue of convenience, inconvenience may loom quite large. That's the first. The second problem is complacency, where within a certain population, and this is emphatically true for COVID-19, there is a thought in people's heads, which is that I'm young, I'm healthy, I've had the flu, this isn't such a terrible thing to risk, and if I get it, so have zillions of people, and it's just not worth troubling myself a whole lot about it. The hysteria about, out there about COVID-19 is exactly that. And for me, vaccination is a low priority. A lot of people are thinking of something like that, not about inconvenience. The third problem is distrust, and this is the most publicized, in some ways the most challenging to meet, but it is in a way uh, sucking the oxygen out of the uh, heterogeneity of the problem in a way that might make solutions more challenging than they would otherwise be. Nonetheless, it's important to note that a number of people think that the vaccine is dangerous, that it has side effects, that it won't work, and that there's profit motive rather than health promotion in the background here. The idea that this is or Operation Warp Speed 
is for some people a, uh, a, uh, 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 a component of distrust. Warp speed with respect to vaccine, that is for some people concerning. Okay, drawing on the work of the World Health Organization, which in turn draws on the work of uh, a great deal of academic uh, 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 researchers, uh, there are some solutions. Insofar as the problem involves convenience, writ, writ very large, what we want is an enabling environment. And uh, this is, I hasten to add, a World Health, World Health Organization term for which I have no uh, responsibility or credit, but I'm in love with this term. I would marry this term were I able to marry terms, and I hope that would not offend my wife. The idea of enabling environment is uh, an extremely clarifying concept for thinking about vaccination and for thinking about uh, other forms of response to COVID-19 where the idea of an enabling environment includes various things. Is it easy, the E in the, face in the FEAST framework? Is it quick? Is it inexpensive? And are people having an experience which is not horrible? At, at best, it would be one in which they are treated with respect and dignity. And if there's a component of the F in the FEAST framework, then all the better. That's a bit challenging, but I can tell you with respect to flu vaccination, where I live in Concord, it does have an F in it. It's a bit of an adventure as the environment is created and it's really quick and it doesn't cost anything. So we wanna know a lot about time, the nature of the experience, the relevant information people have been given and so forth. With respect to complacency, a way in is to uh, work with social influences. And the basic idea here is that three things matter with respect to social influences. What do people perceive as the uh, general behavior of relevant others? What is the perceived uh, norm? And there we're just speaking about the descriptive norm. What do most people do? And that's often used as a heuristic for behavior it often works really well. That's old stuff. Uh, newer stuff points to the keen importance, at least in some tested domains, of a perception of the emerging social norm. This is intriguing because it's incompletely understood. The mechanisms aren't specified yet, but the data is suggestive that if people learn that people are increasingly wearing masks, or people are increasingly engaging in these precautions, or people are starting more and more to get vaccinated. That can be a very powerful instrument of behavior change. And then th there's some evidence that consistent with the following, I think, remarkable proposition, which is that evidence of the new and emerging norm can be a more powerful instrument of behavior change than identification of the existing norm. I wouldn't take that to the bank as an empirical finding, but there's evidence that people don't what, want to be on the wrong side of history or have a kind of heuristic that the uh, new behavior is likely to reflect the uh, best behavior. That is, um, uh, that is uh, an emerging tool, let's say, for uh, promoting better behavior. With respect to distrust and a sense of, um, of fear or suspicion, um, there are several things that are promising. One is to leverage the role of health professionals where within relevant communities that feel imperfect trust, let's say, often nurses and doctors are trusted especially if they can say, not just you should get vaccinated, but I've been vaccinated. Second, often cognition we're learning has an identity component to it in the following sense, that when people think, what is it, is it sensible to do? They think, what kind of person am I? 
or what is my social identity? Now, this may not be, you know, a fully deliberative process, but people tend to think sometimes, what do people like me do? If people think that people who are young do this, or people who are old do that, or people who have a certain political connection do this, or people who have a certain religious connection do that, that can be a meaningful determinant of behavior. The suggestion is that can be an opportunity, it can be a challenge, it can be a kind of uh, strategy where to identify people who share the relevant identity of those who are mistrustful can be a helpful instrument of behavior change. This could be celebrities, it could be the person whom I most trust, Tom Brady, the greatest of all time. Don't argue with me on that one. And if Tom Brady tells me something, I have a heuristic, which is I should do that. I'm being ridiculous here, of course, but uh, you get the general idea. And if it isn't about celebrities or well-known people, it might be as good or even better to point to relevant people in the community who share characteristics of the people who are mistrustful. There are two other ideas with respect to mistrust. One which is intriguing is to leverage anticipated regret. Anticipated regret has been shown to be a predictor of vaccination, and which means that people who anticipate their ex post regret, I didn't get vaccinated, I got sick. That's a very powerful uh, thing to feel and to use it to encourage vaccination by highlighting the consequences of inaction. How would people feel if they didn't get vaccinated and they ended up sick and transmitting it to people they love? There's evidence to suggest that's helpful. Emphasizing the social benefits of vaccination can in some circumstances be a more effective instrument than emphasizing the individual benefits by suggesting that the person you save might be your mother or grandmother or your best friend's aunt. And that can, for some populations, be more helpful than saying that the life you save might be your own. Okay, one general point about this little framework, which takes the three challenges of uh, inconvenience, um, complacency, and distrust, and tries to meet them on their own terms. One general lesson is the heterogeneity of the potential obstacles to vaccine uptake. And another general lesson is the need to test empirically what works and what doesn't. These, uh, this framework, I'm hopeful, I've learned from uh, working with WHO colleagues, bears generally on mask wearing, social distancing, staying at home, uh, and the list is very long. It includes highway safety and uh, precautions of all different kinds. Okay, I'm on to my last topic now, which bears on COVID-19 in particular, and on health and safety and economic well-being in general. The United States imposes over 11 billion hours in paperwork requirements on the American people. I want to pause over that, and that's a Trump administration number. If you took every citizen of Chicago and put them in a room and asked them to spend every day for the next 365 days filling out federal forms for the whole day, then you would not come anywhere close to that 11 billion hours. Many of those hours and paperwork burdens are imposed on students. Some are imposed on university administrators. Some are imposed on faculty. Many are imposed on entrepreneurs who are trying to start companies or get permits or licenses. Many of them are imposed on doctors and nurses and patients. Those of us who have visited the doctor within the last five years probably have experienced some of those 11 billion hours. They are imposed on uh, uh, 
truck drivers, they are imposed on railroad operators, they are imposed on energy providers. The reason those 11 billion hours matter is that even for completely rational actors, it may be the case that they are a wall separating people from something very important, which might be transformative of life and even preservative of life. I'm deliberating whether to tell you an anecdote about government. I'm, going, I'm not going to because it's a little time consuming. It'll make me sad. <laughs> but the abstract form of it is that some things that the government requires of its own employees, while completely reasonable, are sufficiently daunting in terms of sludge that the right approach is just to give up if the stakes aren't that high. Even for some people, they may be poor or poorly educated uh, when the stakes are quite high, and this doesn't involve the anecdote I had in mind, it might be that they will give up. And we do observe that, such that the take up rate for many valuable programs is in the vicinity of 40 to 60%. Recall that if people have present bias or if they have inertia, it may be that sludge is not just a wall between people and something, it's the equivalent of a moat, something they really can't get over. And that might mean that an educational opportunity or a permit to run a business or a license to build something is unavailable because the relevant actor just thinks this is not navigable. Okay, the basic suggestion is it would be very surprising if that 11 billion hours in paperwork were optimal, and also that that 11 billion hours is likely to lowball the aggregate magnitude of frictions, which include not just paperwork requirements, but waiting time, administrative burdens, the need to go various places in a way that um, makes the 11 billion hours seem some fraction of, of what's imposed on people. Okay, what would be very good is to have some sort of welfare analysis of the 11 billion hours, something like a cost benefit analysis to see how many of them are on balance justified. And the good news is that we've seen a kind of war on sludge, mostly bottom up by local state and federal officials over the last months, uncovering requirements whose uh, uh, justification is palpably insufficient in light of their real world uh, impacts on people who are trying to get help. The war on sludge has taken the form of such things as dispensing with interview requirements, authorizing telemedicine, authorizing automaticity where formerly people had to apply for things, authorizing significant simplification of things in domains in which uh, complexity had been the order of the day. There's implicit recognition on the part of those soldiers who've waged the war on sludge of I think the most important work in behavioral science, this is just my personal view in the last decade, which has to do with cognitive scarcity. There's a book called Scarcity which emphasizes that each of us has scarce economic resources, to be sure, um, but we also have limited bandwidth, which means that our capacity to navigate life is less than it would be if we could spend our scarce neurons on everything that matters to us, but we can't. And if a human being is busy or lonely or hungry, or fearful or poor, the problem of cognitive scarcity looms particularly large. And the data is very powerful on all of those that I just mentioned. If you're in love, by the way, your capacity to navigate the rest of life is diminished. That's on balance a great thing, but it does create some not good side effects. And if you're poor, your ability to navigate the range of things that health and economic well-being require you to navigate is compromised. And that's not good. 
much of the war on sludge that we've observed under COVID-19 is explicitly or implicitly a recognition of the problem of cognitive scarcity. Okay, a suggestion is that sludge audits are a very good thing for many institutions. Johns Hopkins could do a sludge audit. Harvard Law School could do a sludge audit. Um, New York public health authorities could do a sludge audit. And these, this could be quite informal and just a way of getting some sort of monthly catalog of how much time people are spending on X and Y and Z, or it could be very quantitative and involve real numbers. We're starting to see sprouts of sludge audits at various institutions. And while the exact dimensions of a sludge audit are very much uh, being built in real time, uh, the early returns are suggestive that sludge audits produce sludge reductions. Okay, I'm done. Uh, the basic theme of the, these remarks is can be uh, unified. The remarks about vaccine uptake, about the feast framework, about behavioral findings, about choice preserving interventions by uh, asking an, a, a question which has particular poignancy, I think, in this period, which is what's the most precious thing that human beings have. Of all the things we are blessed to have, what is the most precious of all? I think we can see from our neighborhoods, maybe our families, and certainly from our extended networks, that a candidate answer to that question is indeed a four letter word and it's time. Let's find, shall we, a way to give our brothers and sisters more of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. For the very insightful talk. Um, I, I think we, before um, opening to the uh, audience, I think we can give uh, some time for the other speakers in the conference to ask questions directly if they want to. Is there anyone who want to ask a question? Um, yeah, Cass, if I may, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so my question is, is it that maybe we got this narrative a bit wrong in some countries by saying that uh, the young are not really in danger, uh, just, about sa just about saving the old? That's a very good question. So be, yes, because some young people get very sick and some don't survive. Now it is true that the risk is lower, but to induce complacency in circumstances in which vaccination can be necessary, both for the collective of young people and the collective of all. It's a very good question about what to say about people who are less at risk, but for many young people who've had COVID, it's a very bad experience even if they make it, fine. Cass, Glenn Harrison here. I have a question. One of the most impressive chapters of the nudge book was when you talked about evil nudgers, when nudges get into the hands of evil people. And, you know, we just need to look back the last four years. We can spot those sort of people quite easily. But quite seriously, could you talk a little bit about the abuse of behavioral insights by evil nudgers? Yes, so uh, you could see someone who is self-interested online who wants people to give up money. And what they do is use the techniques to do that. These are sometimes referred to as dark patterns online. So you could see a self-interested actor saying everyone, that this would be a lie, so it would be worse than even truthful 
manipulative touching, but everyone or the vast majority of people enroll in this program. And let's say it's a terrible program and it's used instrumentally, or people could be automatically enrolled in something that is not at all in their interest. One example is a fraud case brought by the Federal Trade Commission in which people were called up and basically nudged to ha have monthly payments for something that is not at all in their interest. And you could easily imagine a government doing the same thing, um, using social norms or ease to pursue some goal which is not in the national interest or might even be a rights violation. So you can choose your category of, of rights and that could be an infringement, it could be a property right, it could be religious liberty. So uh, I'm sure you have concrete examples in mind, but uh, the- well, Let me just mention one. Uh, actually, I'm thinking of whatever marketing departments do as a perfect example of, of an academic industry dedicated to evil nudging, but more specifically in the context of health, as an example I had in the chat room, some years ago, there was a norm of doctors easing pain by prescribing and overprescribing opioids. Um, you know, behavioral insights, and indeed McKinsey has paid for some of those behavioral insights to be sure. But I'm just concerned about the sense in which we need to, there's sort of a lot of unconditional nudging. Uh, and I know that you've argued strenuously for the need for identifying through cost benefit analyses and so forth, including heterogeneity. But very often that is not done. A lot of the nudging that's going on in the health domain and in other domains is unconditional. And particularly if I say so by people who don't seem to be very interested in preferences and beliefs and other things. Um, are you concerned about that? Deeply, I, I agree completely. And we need much more work on that. I, I, I know you've done some and I'd love to see continuation of that. So um, I'm thinking that there are uh, markets could help so if you have markets that are free and unrestricted, that's not perfect for reasons that Akerlof and Schiller have explored, but markets can help. Uh, fraud pr prevention can help, deception prevention. I have a paper on my computer, which is too lousy to publish, but it's called A Right Not to Be Manipulated. And I think we need a great deal of thought about that there was a paper written in the early 20th century called The Right to Privacy, which actually created the right to privacy. Justice Louis Brandeis was one of the authors. Um, we need to think hard about things that aren't deception or fraud necessarily, but are manipulative. And it, while some nudges just aren't that, like you know, reminding people, at least most aren't manipulative, depends on the content or a disclosure of caloric content. But there are some things that uh, could fall across the line. So we need to think much harder about that. Democracy should be a safeguard against government, malevolent or incompetent nudging. The heterogeneity point is extremely important to have cost benefit analysis as a check is also uh, uh, keenly important. So uh, Thaler, whenever he signs the book, he says nudge for good. And uh, that's uh, that's a start, you know. But it's just a plea. So maybe institutional design. Uh, some of us have thought about a bill of rights for nudging, which would apply to government. Um, and there's a specification of that. Liam has done some extraordinary work on the ethics uh, of of nudging. And uh, at first cut, coercion and mandates, those are the, the worst things. And if there's a choice preserving uh, intervention, it maintains people's right to say, I'm not gonna do that. But it's completely right to say that some forms of manipulation are the same in the same analytical category as coercion. And they run into John Stuart Mill's strictures about on liberty where the problem with a, uh, a coercion is it bypasses the chooser's epistemic advantages about what's best and manipulation can do that as well. I, I'd like to think that uh, nudges, the honorable ones don't cross the line into manipulation. We need a definition to, to know if that's true. 
Thank you. Yeah. So maybe we can ask uh, some question from the audience, Mario. Maybe. Yeah. yeah I uh, I collected some. Here is one for uh, my Hopkins colleague, Kathy McDonald. Uh, on the sham point, uh, on the sham point, what is known about the underlying power of actual norms on behavior versus being told that something is a norm when it actually isn't? Uh, I don't know of any data on that. If you're if you're told if if people are told most people are let's say exercising between the hours of six and seven a.m. and it's credible, then that ought to be the equivalent of t telling them that if it's both credible and true. The danger of telling them that if it's credible but not true is that it will be revealed to be false. And the other bad thing about it is it's a lie. So on welfare grounds, as well as on Kantian grounds, it wouldn't be good to do that. The, the utilitarians are, some of them, very negative about lies for rural utilitarian grounds, that if you lie, you're going to discredit a lot of things, and that's not likely to be a utility. Um, another question uh, from the Philippines. Um, so the news today said that around half of the Filipinos surveyed don't want to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Much of it comes from some previous bad press about, about a uh, uh, vaccine against the dengue fever. Uh, something bad happened in the past that created distrust. So of the techniques to manage distrust, has any approach been shown to have reverse huge initial distrust? Good. I'd want to uh, go back to the papers to see, to answer that. Um, there's a German uh, social scientist named Cornelia Betch, B-E-T-S-C-H, who has done numerous papers on exactly this topic. So I'm going to give an inadequate answer, which is to look there. Um, the, for the Philippines context, it sounds distinctive in the sense that there's a specific determinant of distrust, which you could understand as rational updating or as use of the availability of a stick. I have some thoughts, but they're a little um, uh, ill developed for 346 people. Um, another member of our audience would like more information about the World Health Organization Technical Advisory Group on Behavioral Insights and Sciences for Health. Could you tell us more about that? Yes. Yeah, so, a number of months ago, the World Health Organization. Um, issued a call for a technical advisory group. And the, the, the idea that the DG, Director General, has is that many, behave, many health problems are behavior problems. So if we're talking about smoking or sexual and reproductive health or things that lead to heart disease or cancer, there's a behavioral component. And the World Health Organization has been very strong on the uh, you know, the medical and physiological and other biological and other dimensions, but to focus specifically on the behavioral component is relatively new. They have a behavioral insights uh, uh, unit there, project, which is composed of some superb people who are working with our part, but built in now to the WHO. And the technical advisory group is advising them about how to set up. And of course, COVID-19 has been an early priority area. And that's why our vaccine uptake report was released uh, very quickly. But right now we're working on a series of projects, uh, some connected with COVID-19, some of it broader about health risks. That, that, that is great. Um, so all of the questions that I'm collecting from, from the chat are deep, but this one is uh, particularly deep uh, from Alejandro Hortal. 
is a person who rejects vaccination uh, anti-vaxxer an imperfect chooser or is she or he irrational how would you define irrationality okay i, I avoid the term irrationality as does uh, Kahneman and as does Thaler on the ground that it's not very nice and it suggests something that's more extreme than what behavioral science shows. So if someone, let's say, is uh, unrealistically optimistic, that they think they're less likely than they actually are to get in an automobile accident, to say they're irrational seems to suggest either they're random or they're crazy. But it's just that their risk perception is inaccurate. And that's human, it's not irrational. So, so I would avoid this unkind and, uh, and under ordinary language understanding, not accurate term to say imperfect choosers is if you're um, not buckling your seatbelt because you are thinking I'm a safe driver. Now that might be a good idea if you are you know, an incredibly good driver and everyone around you also is. And if buckling a seatbelt is something you deeply hate, it could be a rational choice. But for the average utility function, it's, it's not. For a, that, someone who chooses not to get vaccinated, um, you could design a scenario in which they'd be irrational, even noting you want to avoid that term. But it would be more likely that they would be boundedly rational or imperfect choosers under imaginable real life scenarios. So to get vaccinated, I was recently vaccinated for the flu. Uh, for let's say anything close to the median utility function, it's easy, it's fast, it doesn't hurt. And the, the discounted value of it exceeds what is really close to zero. And so it would be a lot of inertia not to get vaccinated. So for the median person not to get vaccinated would be from the standpoint of self-interest, boundedly rational, not the right choice. Um, we know that uh, Professor Sunstein has a hard stop at 10, so there is probably room yeah. for one more question. Um, this is another deep question from Nico Lacetera. Uh, it's about the ethics of nudging. Uh, Nico says, uh, maybe uh, perhaps the feast paradigm, uh, could it be adding ad additional restrictions, thereby making libertarian paternalism too paternalistic? Okay, um, um, uh, you could take that question in a couple of different directions. Uh, one direction would be to say um, that given some of the externalities of failing to take precautions and given the self-evident error of failing to take certain precautions, mandates are either a reasonable idea or a good idea. And I agree with that. So mask mandates under, under real world circumstances seem amply justified given the externality and given the self-protection. So that would be saying that libertarian paternalism has in some ways met its match with COVID-19. I, and I wanna put the word in some ways in bold letters, and, and that's true. Um, the other direction to take it would be to say that some instruments under the FEAST framework might look imperfectly libertarian, let's say. So if you make something really fun, really easy, really attractive, so social and so timely, it might be that freedom of choice exists, but it's purely formal. And uh, that's a point. There's a, an argument that some have made that defaults tend to be, have such an informational signal in them and to tend to take such advantage of inertia that they're not as far from a mandate as you might think. So if people are automatically enrolled, let's say, in a savings plan at 3%, let's just suppose data suggests that's where everyone ends up. We might think that the line between that and a mandate is not as bright. 
Now, I'm, I'm channeling a view I don't really agree with, but it's, uh, it's something to be contended with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Feinstein, for the insightful talk and, and, and the discussion. And, and also uh, for, for the time uh, for being with us today and for starting off at this uh, conference. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, um, whether we can then reconvene here in 15 minutes for the contributed session uh, chaired by Aditi Sen. Thank you very much again. Uh, thanks everyone, this was fantastic. Thank you. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, we will now proceed with uh, the first contributor session of the conference. Uh, the chair of this session is Professor Aditi Sen, a health economist uh, in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she's also a member of the core faculty of the Hopkins Business of Health Initiative. Uh, thank you so much, Aditi. Thanks so much, Mario. I'm uh, really excited to be here and uh, thought the first session was great. So really looking forward to uh, hearing the papers in this, um, in this session. So we have um, four speakers. Each will speak for 15 minutes. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat if they are kind of immediately clarifying questions. I think there are some co-authors um, present who will try to answer them in the chat. Um, and Mari and I will also be keeping an eye on the chat if there is, seems like there's a really pressing question um, we can interrupt, but we'll try not to. We'll save most of the questions for um, the last 15 minutes. So our first um, speaker is uh, Marta Sara Garcia. If you are ready, you can share your screen and can go ahead and I'll give you a five minute warning. Okay, um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for putting together this amazing conference. And um, we're very excited to present here. I'm presenting joint work with Nora Czech, who's on the panel, so she can also um, chime in if there are questions in the chat. Um, what I'm going to present today is a subset of what we have been doing since the pandemic started. Our aim has been to better understand um, people's decision to um, get tested. So how much people are willing to wear cost, bear costs of uh, testing and more recently to look at vaccination intentions, what could we do to increase vaccination intentions? And so for the talk today, I'm gonna um, study, uh, focus on the study we have re recently conducted. So it's a study on the effects of defaults. We just had a keynote by Cass Sunstein that uh, talked about choice architecture. So that's gonna be what's motivated us to try to think about how choice architecture could affect behavior in the context of COVID-19. And I'm gonna show you results of a recent study in which we looked at the effects of defaults on um, COVID-19 test demand and the effects of defaults on uh, vaccination intentions. Um, we have seen that they are important and relevant in many domains. We will, you know, in a nutshell, look at um, the effects on testing. We find rather strong effects. On vaccination intentions, we, we find rather um, small effects. And we think, uh, and our data suggests that one of the reasons may be that with COVID-19 vaccines, people may have made up their mind. They're either very sure that they want the vaccine or they're either very um, against taking the vaccine. And so perhaps in those contexts, the role of defaults will be more limited. And the challenge will be in finding who's more uncertain and perhaps um, maybe more affected by defaults. Okay, so to broadly motivate um, what I'm gonna talk about today, we all know that broad testing and broad vaccination take up is essential to stop the, the spread of COVID-19. But we also know that it's not easy. If you think of the FEAST framework that Cass just presented, one of the letters was the E, and we see that it can be costly. It's not easy, and it may be actually costly to get tested. So 
Um, some people have access to free testing, but that's under certain circumstances. Some people have to pay out of pocket if they just want to get the test because they're curious. On the other hand, it's not only that you may have to pay some money, but also that it may cost you time. So long wait lines, complicated processes and so forth could also discourage people from getting tested, although we want people to get tested often in order to be able to better um, control the spread of the virus. Another issue that has been pointed out in the keynote, so this is kind of all great uh, to motivate our, our talk today, is that you know, new products and especially the COVID-19 vaccine may not be trusted by everyone. Um, and there's concerns that, well, if, the, if it's not trusted, then people may, may not take it up. And that's actually something we find in our study. A second related concern is that not everyone trusts the vaccine equally. And one thing that has been raised is that maybe Black Americans trust the vaccine less. Recent data has actually shown that Black Americans are getting vaccinated at lower rates than white Americans. And our data will also um, support this in the, in the sense that it will show or it shows that uh, Black Americans uh, trust the vaccine significantly less within our study and within our sample, of course. Okay, so given these challenges, especially with the COVID, um, the COVID variants, the new COVID variants, we want very high vaccine um, uptake. And so it's um, even if take up rates or intentions around 60 or 70%, if there are new variants and these are um, not, the vaccines are not as effective against them, then we need even higher take up rates. So um, a recent study, very recent data suggests that um, we need at least 82% of the population to get the vaccine, um, considering the Pfizer vaccine to control the spread of the new variant, right? So the challenge is to get a lot, a lot of people, um, a broad share of the population um, vaccinated, 80 to 85%. Okay, so given these complexities, the broader question we're interested in as well, how can we use behavioral insights to increase demand for testing and demand for vaccination? We are gonna focus on one aspect um, that is promising based on all of the behavioral public policy and behavioral insights we have been seeing over the last few years, which is choice architecture. The question is gonna be if we default people in versus default them out, um, do we change their testing decisions? Do we change their vaccination intentions? Okay, so there is uh, recent research and, and Cass Sunstein has talked about the WHO report. There's also research by Gretchen Chapman um, that, um, that is part of this, which is looking at flu shots. So if you look at flu shots um, and you think about defaults, they have been shown to be effective. How do they work? They basically default people into an appointment to get a flu shot. Defaulting people into these appointments increases the likelihood with which uh, they take the vaccine. So taking that um, evidence also as, as inspiration for us, what we did was ask, um, can defaults increase intentions to take the vaccine? So this is gonna be just intentions. Um, and so you have to caveat with that, that um, there may be steps when you go to actual um, taking the vaccine, but we're looking at intentions as a first step. And we know intentions are highly correlated with actual take up. And then PCR testing, which is infection testing, this is something that we may also want to increase and we're looking at the effect of defaults on that. And for that, we actually used incentivized decisions in our study. Okay, so I'm gonna present results of these two behaviors, but we have two other behaviors I'm not gonna present because they're similar to PCR testing, which is antibody testing and air quality monitor demand. Um, and in, across all of our experiments, what we're gonna have is subjects either presented with an opt-in framing an opt-out framing or active choice. And I'm gonna present exactly how that worked in the next two slides so that you see how participants, how people were making decisions. Um, we run this in an online experiment pre-registered on prolific academic with over 2000 subjects. We had this uh, previous research evidence and also uh, from the interest in the media and the, the public policy discussions um, that black Americans is, are an important group. And so in our study, we oversampled to have a large enough share of black Americans and be able to say um, things and look, do, look at heterogeneous treatment effects for them. We don't find heterogeneous treatment effect, but we do find differences in the levels and I will talk about them um, in a second. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we um, try to study defaults in the context of vaccine and in the context of testing? So for defaults in the context of COVID vaccine take up, as I said, we're looking at intentions and we use a similar framing as was used in the Gretchen Chapman studies on the flu shot. If you're in the opt-in treatment, you're told you can schedule an appointment and you're asked, what would you choose? 
either to not uh, receive the vaccine, which is your default, or to opt in and receive the appointment. In the opt out, you're you're told you've been scheduled to receive you've scheduled you've you've been appointed or you have received an appointment to receive the vaccine. So that's scheduled for you. Um, and you can either keep it as is, so then you would receive the vaccine or opt out. And then we have an active choice, which you could think is neither opting in or opting out, really asking people, do you want the vaccine or not? And so these are obviously changing the presentation of choices um, and, and changing how you know, the options are presented, but it preserves both options, right? Something that Kaz was mentioning is that this doesn't take you away. If you don't want the vaccine, you can opt out if you're in the opt out treatment. If you really want it, you can always opt in or opt out. So that preserves the choice freedom, but just presents the choices differently. With PCR testing, how do we do decisions about PCR testing? And those are different subjects than those that make the vaccine decisions. Um, we um, present people with a choice to take an at-home PCR test or to receive it. And so using a multiple price list, what they do is they go over several decisions, either choosing the test or a gift card, which is a monetary payment that they can take instead of a test. And we had both payments to take the test and payments not uh, for the test. So people having to pay or give up money in order to, uh, to receive the test. And we used a very similar design. Obviously in this case, it's, it's slightly different because it's, it's the, the test and not a vaccine. So people have been in the opt-in treatment, people were randomly allocated to receive the gift. They knew that, but they could change it for the PCR test. In the opt-out, they were randomly allocated for, to the test and they could change it for the gift card. And in the active choice, they could actively choose either or the two options. So there was no framing in which you can change it for something that is the default for you. Okay, so th that's the setting. What we're gonna look is at the effects of opt-in, opt-out and active choice on behavior. For the PCR test, our dependent variable or our outcome of interest is gonna be willingness to pay. So how much people are willing to give up um, in terms of to pay for the test. And for vaccine, it's going to be the intention to take. So, how many? What fraction of the proportion? What fraction of our subjects um, state an intention to take the vaccine? Obviously, take these two comparisons with a grain of salt. Within a given choice, a given product or the behavior, those that's the relevant comparison. Um, but what we find is very strong effects on PCR testing. So, if you're in the opt-in treatment, willingness to pay is five dollars versus if you're in the opt-out treatment, our willingness to pay is up to $20. So it really does seem to make a difference if you're, in a, if you're defaulted into testing. That's where we see the highest uh, PCR test take up. And um, the active choice is somewhere in between. Now, when we look at the vaccine, we find smaller effects. So around 65 to 70% of our subjects um, indicate an intention to take the vaccine. And that increases by five percentage points if you're in the opt-out treatment. So the effect and the direction is positive, but not significant. You could worry, well, maybe, you know, these findings are not robust. We, collect more, we are actually collecting more data and our new data that is doubling the sample size suggests, again, the same magnitude of the effect is five percentage points. So it's positive, but it seems limited. And we want even higher effects. So so we're looking and thinking about other things one could do. Um, Marta, you have just over four minutes or so left. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to go now basically into exploring what, who, who wants to get the vaccine. So focusing on the vaccine intentions, the levels, what are the differences in, across groups in the population in terms of their intentions to take the vaccine, and then briefly talk about heterogeneous treatment effects. Okay, so if we look just... Uh, broad differences, broad differences looking at just controlling for age, gender, ethnicity, and income, what we find is that Black Americans in our sample indicate to be 20 percentage points um, have lower intentions um, to take the vaccine, so that's significant, and lower income individuals also indicate lower intentions to get the vaccine. Now, what we find is that when you add a broader set of controls, and in particular, trust in the vaccine, that seems to explain or predict um, intentions to take the vaccine really strongly. And this is not surprising. What it, we also find that it's correlated and Black Americans trust the vaccine less. And so once you control for trust in the vaccine, this difference between Black and white Americans is no longer there. And the role of income is smaller. Okay, so trust in the vaccine seems really important. Now, 
what you could think is, well, maybe those who do not trust are the ones we should you should be targeting. Definitely, but um, for defaults, probably that's not the most effective thing. Um, so if you do not trust the vaccine, nudging you in the sense of defaulting you into the vaccine is probably gonna have smaller effects. And that's what we find in our sample. But we are looking and we have some results that I wanna show you into who is then more likely to be affected by default. So if we opt in people in, which people are going to respond to the defaults more? And what we've done to kind of discipline this heterogeneous treatment effect analysis is to look at causal forest, predict basically the effects of being defaulted into a vaccine appointment. They reveal some heterogeneity. Don't take these um, points around zero, like as uh, smaller than zero as like negative. There's just a lot of people seem to not be affected, but there's a sub sample of people that may be affected um, by this framing or default. And so, what we find thus far, just very briefly, is that one of the things that seems to matter is belief about past infection. If you think you have had an infection in the past, you may think that you have antibodies and that there you're more uncertain, should you get the vaccine or not, because you already have some type of protective immunity. So our preliminary results suggest that those who are more uncertain about whether to get the vaccine or not are going to be those that are gonna react more uh, potentially to, um, to defaults. And just to end on a, on a more positive note, perhaps, and to think, you know, thinking forward, something that Cass has mentioned and that comes up in our data is that as more and more people get vaccinated, it would be socially what we see, and that may encourage further vaccination. So we ask people, how likely would you be to take the vaccine, depending on how many others get it in your community? And there's definitely a lot of conditionality. And so the higher the take up in your community, perhaps the higher the take up that we see, um, and this could be a positive kind of cascading effect. And just to conclude, we find that defaults are really important. They could increase taste, test take up. For the vaccines, we seem to find more limited effects. And what they suggested that maybe we need to target those defaults um, to people who are more uncertain. And, and maybe on those, we will have actually quite robust and significant effects. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Marta. That was great. Um, I think that um, there were, we have um, just a couple of seconds, but somebody had a question about the sample and yeah. who was recruited. Can you just talk, to that, talk about that for a second and then we'll go on? Yeah. Um, so we have run two types of studies, one based on a, a quota representative sample of the U.S. population. This one was, a con the, the data I presented today is from Prolific Academic. That's just a convenient sample of people who sign up to participate. But what we did was, recruit people um, or target if you only you know if you only recruit the convenience sample over 90 percent of them are white americans and we wanted a substantial fraction of black americans so within that platform we invited particularly or put a particular emphasis on recruiting black americans we have around 30 to 40 percent of black americans in our sample okay um uh, let's Okay, great. I think we'll um, we'll come back to some other questions um, during the general uh, discussion at the end. Um, thank so, you. Thank you. So next up, we have um, Andre, I believe. Just checking my notes. Great. Yes, Andre Hoffmeyer. Can you see my screen, Aditi? We can. I can anyway. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll get going then. Uh, hello, everyone, and many thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm Andre Hoffmeyer. I'm sure you've read the title of my presentation by now, so I'll move swiftly on. There were a number of people involved with this project and I thought I should introduce the team. On the top row is uh, Harold, Glenn and me. In the middle is Don, Mark and Todd. And at the bottom is Brian, who's clearly just cracked a mildly amusing joke during one of our many Zoom calls um, over the course of the project. Now, the study itself, um, the seven collaborators are based in three different locations with uh, Glenn, Mark and Todd in Atlanta, Don in Cork and Harold, Brian and me in Cape Town, which made the logistical planning for the study a little bit tricky. Um, the study itself was actually only run in Atlanta and Cape Town and had the following setup. Basically, uh, subjects had to participate in two surveys and complete four experimental tasks. One of which uh, was to elicit their subjective beliefs about COVID-19 uh, prevalence and mortality. The next was a standard risk preference task, a time preference task, and an intertemporal risk preference task. We had two treatments in the study, one where we, where we varied the order of survey questions. Um, one of our surveys asked uh, about COVID, and we were interested to see whether there was an order effect in terms of 
asking the survey questions first and then they're completing the belief task or vice versa. We also varied the participation fee across the two locations. Uh, this is to account for uh, attrition statistically. So in the US, we used participation fees of 5, 10, and $15, and in South Africa, 40, 60, and 80 Rand. We conducted six waves um, over the course of six months. They were uh, roughly spaced one month apart. Um, and as you can see, they were conducted on um, the same date in both locations. But uh, obviously in Cape Town, we started six hours before Atlanta, given the time difference. All in all, we uh, have data on 598 subjects in Atlanta uh, at a total cost of around $72,000. And we recruited and um, have data on 544 subjects in Cape Town uh, for a total cost of about $42,000, given the very sad state of the South African RAND. Now, I should just situate this presentation within the larger product, or at least project, of which it forms a part. We've actually sketched uh, eight papers that we um, intend to write, and we've written three already. Um, I'd like to draw attention to this companion paper um, because it really explains the logistics of running the experiments, the software we designed and so on. And we provide all the source code for our experiments on Brian's GitHub page. This other companion paper explains how we derive the intervals over which to elicit people's beliefs about COVID-19 prevalence and mortality on the basis of epidemiological models. So to get a full sense of the study, it's really useful to um, consult all of these papers, which you'll find on the CIRA website. Looking at the pandemic itself, I'm sure we can all agree there was a remarkable evolution in terms of infections and deaths over the course of uh, 2020. And in this figure, the gray lines represent the dates um, of our experimental waves. I'd like to briefly draw attention to these uh, panels at the, the bottom of the slide, which Glenn painstakingly put together, uh, where the intensity of the color represents the intensity of infections or deaths. So if you look at the, the spike in infections um, from about October to uh, December, uh, if you look at the, the bar below that, you'll see there's a very bright, bright and intense blue. I mention this now because these bars get carried over to some of our other figures um, and represent really the temporal evolution of the pandemic. Now, the first set of economic preferences we were interested in are atemporal risk preferences or just risk preferences as most people know them and time preferences. We've administered these tasks many times over many years in many different locations. So I'm not gonna go into the intricacies of the experimental design. Importantly, in terms of risk preferences, we are able to estimate structural models of expected utility theory and non-expected utility theories, which in this case, we focus on rank dependent utility. Uh, our design also allows for tests of whether people satisfy the reduction of compound lotteries axiom and whether they exhibit local asset integration. In terms of our time preference task, the, the uh, the crucial thing is that it allows estimation of both exponential and non-exponential discounting models. In this paper and presentation, we focus on quasi-hyperbolic discounting as an alternative to exponential. This is the interface for the atemporal risk preference task. Very straightforward binary choice between the left lottery and the right lottery inspired by Heyer and Orm. Our time preference task, also pretty straightforward. We have a calendar at the top of the display. The black box represents uh, the date on which the experiment was actually run. So this was the first wave in May. The blue square, or at least the pink square and the green square represent where the smaller sooner and larger later amounts of money would be paid out. The second set of preferences we're interested in is intertemporal risk preferences. I actually gave a 45 minute presentation on intertemporal risk preferences in Oslo a few years ago and realized that if I wanted to really do this topic justice, I would completely run out of time in this presentation. So I think the best way to explain the difference is uh, by drawing the distinction between atemporal risk preferences on the one hand and intertemporal risk preferences on the other. Someone is atemporally risk averse if they're averse to variability of outcomes at a point in time. Intertemporal risk aversion, on the other hand, refers to an aversion to variability of outcomes over time. 
Now, the crucial thing about implementing an intertemporal risk preference task is it allows us to estimate non-additive intertemporal utility functions. If we think about the standard uh, discounted expected utility framework, that is additively separable. And additive separability implies intertemporal risk neutrality. You would have no preference between the two intertemporal lotteries on this slide, assuming additive separability. We do away with that by implementing this task to see whether our decision makers are actually intertemporally risk averse or intertemporally risk seeking, and obviously intertemporally risk averse. This is the interface for the task. You've pretty much seen it on the pr uh, previous slide, so I'll move on. One of the major novelties of this study was uh, the elicitation of subjective belief distributions about eight specific events. And we used a standard quadratic scoring rule to incentivize subjects to report their beliefs. We focused, as I mentioned, on COVID-19 prevalence and mortality. We focused on both prevalence and mortality either one month ahead or on December 1st, 2020, and for the population as a whole or for those um, aged 65 and over. We importantly developed four different frames for each belief question, and these were based on well-known epidemiological models. As explained to subjects, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was used as the source to determine subject payment. And the crucial thing about eliciting belief distributions is that this allows us to focus on bias and confidence in beliefs. Now, it's pretty important to understand the subjective belief task interface for what I'm going to show you later. So I'm going to spend a minute or two discussing it. As you can see, the lowest possible interval corresponding to the question, how many people will be infected with COVID by December 1st, 2020, ranges between zero and three million. This particular question was asked on the first wave of our study, the 29th of May. So um, infections were nowhere close to 3 million by this point. So if you were really optimistic about the US response to the virus, you may allocate a lot of tokens to bin one. On the other end of the spectrum, we have bin 10. If you had a doomsday scenario in your head that 50 or 60 or 100 million people would be infected by December 1st, you'd allocate a lot of tokens to this particular bit. The way we constructed these intervals is included in um, our companion working paper, which I mentioned earlier. And as I emphasized, each uh, wave, each question had four different frames. So whereas one subject may have seen these particular intervals within which to allocate tokens, different subjects would have seen different intervals across the frames. Now, this is the actual token allocation of subject 165. As you can see, this subject allocated zero tokens to bin one and zero tokens to bin 10, but the rest of the token allocation is nicely symmetric. The CDC value on the 1st of December was 13.6 million. So the subject who um, reported these beliefs or included this token allocation would have received about $17 on the basis of this report. Now, this is a slide that I could talk about for ages. It explains how eliciting subjective belief distributions allow us to focus both on bias in terms of whether the um, allocation is uh, focuses or centered on the correct answer, and similarly to assess the confidence in beliefs. That'll take me far too long, though. I want to get on to the results. So we have the results related to our yeah, Andrew, preferences about five and minutes. beliefs. So Excellent. Easy. Thank you. Um, I'll start off by focusing on the atemporal risk attitude results. Now, this figure graphs the um, atemporal risk premium, which, as we know, is just the difference between the certainty equivalent, or at least the expected value of a lottery, and its certainty equivalent. Importantly, the green bars in the figure represent estimates from 232 subjects who took part in our COVID experiments but also took part in experiments run in 2019 before the pandemic. So we have a really interesting contrast between subjects who took part in risk preference experiments in 2019 and then 2020 during the pandemic. Now, we estimated structural models of expected utility theory and rank dependent utility theory. If you look at the EUT results, there's not much going on there. They seem pretty stable over time, and they're very similar to the estimates we get from 232 people of the same sample, but pre-pandemic. The rank dependent utility results are very different, on the other hand. 
you'll notice a lot of movement over time as the uh, pandemic progresses, which those blue and red bars show you at the bottom of the slide. But more importantly, the estimates of the risk premium are positive, indicating risk aversion. Compare this to the dashed green line at the bottom of the figure. Those are the rank dependent utility estimates for those 232 subjects who took part in a risk preference task in 2019 before the pandemic. And that suggests that they were effectively risk neutral. This shows what happened. The action is in terms of probability weighting. As you can see at the top, before the pandemic, there was global probability optimism, which has a big impact on the decision weights applied to the utility of the outcomes. During the pandemic, on the other hand, we find the relatively standard inverse S-shaped probability weighting function, which doesn't have a massive effect on the decision weights and leads to a positive risk premium, therefore risk aversion. On to the second result, we have relatively stable time preferences. There's a lot I could say about this figure, but I won't in the interests of time. You can see that there's some interesting differences across the quasi-hyperbolic and exponential uh, specifications, which were naturally estimated jointly with the rank dependent utility uh, model of choice under risk, so as to incorporate the curvature of the utility function when estimating these discount rates. We also find very stable intertemporal risk attitudes in the sense that there are no statistically significant differences over the course of the pandemic. But what's crucial about this figure is that our subjects are intertemporally risk averse. If the parameter rho is equal to zero as indicated by that gray line, that would be intertemporal risk neutrality, the standard additively separable intertemporal utility function. Given that rho is positive and significantly positive, our sample is intertemporally risk averse, and this is something that should be taken into account when modeling choices, or at least risky choices, through time. Finally, I'd like to focus on subjective beliefs. Now, I realize that this figure is busy. I probably spent about 30 hours working on it over the last week, and I'll do my best to explain it in a simple as possible way by focusing specifically just on wave one. Okay, now this is a scatter plot of the average tokens allocated to each bin in our task, where the bins are color coded. And remember, there are four frames per belief question, which is why there are four dots per color. The four navy dots refer to bin one, the four gray dots refer to bin 10. We have our estimated beta distribution overlaid on the scatter plot, so that represents the scatter plot and was estimated jointly with a rank dependent utility model of choice under risk. The gray bar represents the current level of deaths the day before the wave took place. Okay, so that serves as a reference point because that's the data that subjects could access while actually taking part in our subjective beliefs task. The black dashed line is the mean of our estimated beta distribution, and the red dashed line is the true answer as reported by the CDC on the 1st of December, which was approximately 270,000. So if we understand the wave one figure, we can now look at all of the waves together. We see that in wave one, the mean belief was well below the true answer. In wave two, it got much closer to the true answer, in waves three, four, and five, it actually overshot the correct answer. It's very hard to see what's going on in wave six, because as you'll notice, all of these waves have a common x-axis. So if we zoom in specifically on wave six, and notice I've changed the axis to only focus on uh, 220,000 to 300,000, we see that there's still a lot of variation in people's beliefs and that the mean belief lies below the true answer as reported by the CDC. These are very pre preliminary results. We have a lot more work to do. We're actually planning to build a Bayesian hierarchical model that takes into account all the information contained in the frames and the waves, but that's for future work. To sum up, uh, to sum up at least, uh, running experiments during COVID is certainly challenging. We go into a lot of detail in our companion paper about how we actually got this study off the ground. And our objective was to really bring the tools that we had developed in the lab and the field to achieve as much experimental control as possible 
in an online environment during the pandemic. Now, clearly, the extent to which control is lost in online experiments remains an open question. But in future, we expect that a lot more people will use mixtures of both face-to-face -face and online experiments than was the norm before COVID-19 emerged as a mother of invention. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andre. Um, and next, we have um, Jula Saris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I couldn't agree more that uh, doing experiments during the pandemic is, uh, is rather difficult. What I would like to present you is uh, essentially a field experiment uh, which subject was, uh, was uh, the behavioral effect of face masks um, in, in, in different phrasing, the, uh, the community use of, uh, of face masks. So here you can see the, uh, the name of my co-authors. Uh, we did the experiments uh, in, uh, in Berlin uh, last uh, spring. Okay, so let me, let me start with the motivation um, of this project. Uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, studying the effect of face masks on social distancing came from a claim of, uh, from the, uh, of the World Health Organization. So let me read it to you. The use of medical masks in the community may create a false sense of security with neglect of other essential me measures such as hand hygiene practices and physical distancing. Now, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, remark appeared uh, in, the, uh, in the official guideline of uh, WHO. It was, also, um, it was also used by other health authorities, and this is currently still stated in the official uh, guidelines. So, and, and, and this, uh, this is why I think that this uh, question is still relevant and needs to, uh, and needs to be addressed. So in, in order to address this, uh, directly after, after publishing uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, guideline on April 6th, uh, we started to work on, uh, on a field experiment to, uh, to verify uh, this claim. So whether, whether it must actually uh, create a false sense of security um, and, uh, and make people ignore um, precaution and social distancing. Okay, so this is a, a brief guideline of the experiment. There were two uh, data collection periods. So briefly, it looked like this. The, fir uh, the first data collection happened between 18th, 18th and 24th of uh, April. Uh, during this time, there was a strict lockdown uh, in Berlin uh, with partial uh, stay home order, closed stores, but no mask mandate. So masks were actually um, not mandated in any uh, public area in any com community setting other than uh, in hospitals. And uh, uh, in the second period, the situ situation has changed. Uh, we did this a month later. Between, uh, between the two periods, mass mandate was in uh, introduced in stores and in public transport. This is important because, uh, because the measurement was carried out in uh, front of stores uh, in, uh, in Berlin City. Uh, there was also there were also relaxation measure measures. Uh, several stores and establishment reopened. Uh, meanwhile, uh, these were all addressed as uh, as control uh, control variables uh, in the experiment. Okay, so let uh, let me introduce you to how we uh, how we measure uh, measure this and what I what I mean by effect of face mask on social distancing. So the set, uh, setting was the following. Here I uh, I will explain how we uh, how we me uh, measured um, uh, social distancing. So cons uh, consider a post office or a su uh, supermarket in front. Uh, um, uh, in front of which there is a waiting line. Now, this is still a common site in Berlin because there are restrictions on the number of people per, uh, permitted uh, in stores. So uh, this, uh, the measurement method is the following. The experimenter joins uh, the waiting line, uh, stands at the end, and, uh, and they are waiting, uh, waiting for the subject to arrive. The subject is the next person joining uh, the line and the distance, uh, distance or me a measurement of uh, social distancing is the dis uh, distance the subject keeps uh, from the experimenter. Uh, now, uh, now this, how we can uh, measure this? Uh, 
you uh, if you have a newer smartphone you probably also have an extend is an augmented reality app called usually it's called tape measure or so, uh, something like this by which uh, you can measure the distance between two points on, uh, on the ground with one centimeter precision so by basically a mobile a mobile device uh, one, one can uh, one can actually um, obtain a measurement of the uh, distance kept by uh, by the subject so uh, the experiment also recorded other control variables such as perceived age and gender of the um, of the subject, uh, whether they arrived uh, to the waiting line with other people, whether they, uh, they were minors. Now there were two uh, treatment conditions in both um, uh, observation periods in equal numbers. Uh, the experimenter either wore uh, a face mask or, uh, or they, they did not. Okay, so these were the two treatment conditions, and this yields uh, two uh, subsamples with mask and, and without mask. Uh, and uh, this this allows us this experimental um, design allows us to compare uh, the uh, two conditions and estimate the effect of face mask on uh, behavior and more specifically social distancing. Okay, so so just to illustrate this, uh, these are the uh, experimenters. Um, um, so we, uh, we use the relatively uniform uh, neutral uh, appearance and in the two di uh, different treatment conditions, the uh, experimenters uh, either did not wear, uh, wear a, uh, a face mask or, or they did. We used an FFP2 or as known in the US and N95 uh, respirators. And the uh, reason was simp uh, simply that this was more readily available in pharmacies in Berlin at the ti uh, time of the first observation period than uh, surgical masks. And we also believe that at the time, the general public was not fully aware of the dis difference between the different uh, type of, types of uh, masks. Okay, so this uh, this is about uh, the uh, design. Uh, one, uh, one more detail that uh, we um, used different uh, locations scattered uh, around Berlin uh, near our place of residence. Uh, back then there were restrictions on how far we, uh, we could leave um, our homes. Uh, the limit was two kilometers. That uh, This gave a uh, re relatively clear structure on uh, where to uh, carry, carry this out. In both observational peri uh, periods, we used uh, the same locations in all, uh, in all cases in front of uh, the same establishments. Uh, now we work, uh, work with a number of hypotheses that we wanted to test. Uh, here I present uh, the second study. So the, fir uh, first, uh, fir uh, the first study was uh, separately published as a, as a preprint. And at the, at the time of this pre-registered hypothesis, uh, we already knew that face masks actually increase social distancing in the first observational period. And we hypothesized the following. Face masks uh, serve as a cue so actually, uh, the presence of face masks uh, might serve as a reminder and actually reduce the cognitive effort necessary to, uh, to comply with the uh, recommendations of, of the healthcare authorities. Okay, so now in the second observational period, there's a, there was a mask mandate in the stores. So what does it mean? If you join a waiting line, it, it means that you must have a face mask that you're either wearing or it's in your pocket, right? So what, what we hypothesized uh, is uh, is that there would be no mask effect in uh, in the second period, and actually there there would be three conditions un, uh, under under which uh, the mask can serve a cue. All conditions e uh, except no mask con uh, condition in the first sample. This uh, this is these uh, two hypotheses, and the third one uh, is that in the second period. Mass and unmass sub, uh, subjects uh, keep the same uh, distance um, from the experimenter, si uh, simply because masks are widespread uh, by uh, mid of May. Okay, so the, uh, for, for the first hypothesis, we, uh, we found no support uh, in both conditions, in both the mass condition and the no mass condition, there was a drop in distancing between the two periods. What you see here are OLS estimates in which, uh, in which, in which the outcome variable is, uh, is distance me uh, measured in centimeters. And here pol uh, policy, it sim uh, simply refers to uh, the per uh, periods. This is a, uh, this is a period uh, dummy. Now, when, when it comes to hypothesis two, that, uh, that is our main subject of interest, uh, the results were interesting. So, uh, so what we find again is that masks have a uh, strong positive effect on distancing. Uh, 
On the other hand, there is no significant difference between the two uh, periods. Okay, so in both periods, there, uh, there is a positive significant effect of, uh, of uh, mass uh, in our sample. When it comes to hy uh, hypothesis three, uh, what we found in the pre-policy sample, uh, in which there were very few mass uh, subjects, the mass subject kept, kept a significantly larger di uh, distance than the unmass subject. Now we contributed uh, this to uh, a sample selection. So, si uh, so si uh, simply the, uh, the uh, two, sa uh, two samples are substantially different. If only 17% of people wore a mask, pro uh, probably they already had a different attitude to, uh, towards wearing, uh, wearing a mask. On the other hand, in a post policy sample, the, uh, the share of mass subject inc increased to 40%. So I would like to emphasize that within the store, they had to wear a mask, and, uh, and here this observation was obtained in front of the store before, uh, before they, uh, before they enter, enter the uh, establishment. So here in this subsample, there, uh, the mass subjects still keep a larger distance on average, but the distance is not significant whatsoever. Uh, we also predicted another uh, variable, the number of stores that reopened between the two observational periods. Okay, so this variable uh, assumes value zero for the first observational period and, uh, and uh, either zero or a small positive number in the second observational period. Now, now the interesting finding is that the number of real, uh, reopening stores for the second pe uh, period actually, uh, actually reduces the average distancing. And if you include this variable in the model, then, then the uh, difference of uh, between the two periods uh, vanishes. So, uh, so basically, the difference between the two periods, uh, bec uh, because of which we, we find no support for hypothesis one, is well explained by the number of stores. Uh, we do not make uh, made the claim, never, nevertheless, that this is a policy of fact sim uh, of uh, of the mask mandate sim uh, simply because a month passed between the two observational periods. So all we can, all we can say say that in the uh, in the sample there is a difference between the two periods, and this is probably uh, due to relaxation measures, or at least the data is consistent uh, with this idea. No, just uh, under yes. just under about five minutes. Thank you very much. No, when uh, when it comes to this uh, distancing, this uh, this is a structural model. So one, one can ask, okay, uh, okay, but what what about details? What you can see here is uh, this um, is distancing uh, the uh, cumulative distribution function of the distance var variable uh, in the tot uh, total sample uh, separately for the no mask and the mask condition. So as you can see. Uh, whatever uh, cutoff value you uh, you consider, uh, there is a str uh, there is a higher compliance uh, rate in the mass condition than uh, than in the no no mass conditions. It's re it's rather visible that act uh, that actually uh, there is a first order stochastic dominance going on here. Uh, so the, I, I would say that this is a clear re result and it's not driven uh, driven by our cho uh, choice of modeling. Okay, so one, one can ask, okay, but what is driving this result? So why we, why we find a result that is not consistent with the claim of the World Health Organization? Okay, why don't, why don't they, why don't they uh, create a full sense of security? So uh, we had uh, another study. So I, 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 present, I presented one paper, but, uh, but previously uh, we, had, uh, we had another paper using, using a larger first period sample and an online survey experiment that gives a li little bit more insights. In, uh, in this one, we, uh, we use the German uh, online uh, sample uh, in, in which uh, the uh, participants, the online participants were presented with one of the picture, uh, pictures of the experimenters that, I, uh, that I've just shown you. So they were present, uh, presented with, uh, with, the, with a picture of, of uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, experimenters who uh, who actually did the field study, random, uh, randomly with or, with or without, without face mask, and we elicited uh, their opinion ab uh, about uh, a couple of things. The two two most important questions you uh, you can see here. Number uh, number one, what do you think is the minimum distance the person in the photograph would like the person approaching the waiting line to keep from uh, from her or him by waiting in line outside the post office? Okay, so by this we want we wanted to learn if there is a respect uh, uh, signal. 
So whether 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 uh, whether Musk can actually actually signal preference. So the di uh, the difference is, is quite large and it's significant at one per, uh, at one percent uh, level. Musk. Uh, so this is evidence that Musk might serve as a respect uh, as, a, as a as a signal of preference for social distancing. Uh, and uh, and when uh, when it comes to the perception uh, perception of beliefs about the ha uh, health situation uh, of the uh, of the person, we found no difference between the two treatment conditions. Okay, this, these these findings cannot necessarily be generalized to other population or, or other countries or a different phase of the pandemic, but uh, this uh, this sam sample provides some evidence that other uh, other than uh, other than a cue, uh, other uh, other than a reminder. Uh, must can also uh, also serve as signals. Uh, now, uh, now when it when it comes to a summary, inst uh, instead of summarizing the main results, I would I would like to emphasize that uh, we are um, not the only ones who are working on this. So I I, I saw that some uh, some of the authors of these studies are also here. So one can say that yes, our, our study was conducted in uh, in Germany, and we can we cannot uh, claim uh, claim a strong external validity based on a, sing a single country. But actually, there is plenty of evidence that the false sense of security claim of uh, of WHO is weak and, and and should be revised. Okay, okay. So there are different aspects. This field study uh, was on social distancing conditionally on go uh, on going outside. And, and and entering a store. Now there 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 is other evidence that false sense of security does not play a strong role and is not a strong argument against the community use of face masks in different settings. So there is a, there is evidence that the, uh, actually mask uh, mask mandates improve hand hygiene. They reduce the frequency of face touching and have no effect whatsoever on community mobility, which is basically the time. Uh, spent uh, in community setting uh, in the study, they used uh, mobile data, and uh, and there is, uh, as, as you've seen, field evidence on that. Uh, the mask uh, mask wearing has a positive effect on uh, so social distancing as well. So the, the, there was there was a substantial uh, effort, to the, and um, and I, I would say that uh, the um, behavior sci scientist co uh, community invested a lot of time uh, into this and I would like to say thank you for all the um, all the other other scientists who work on the other projects because I think we are we are on the same level in this and this thank you so much thank you very much um, and our uh, last presenter today is Rick Wilson You may be on mute, Rick. I think I saw that you were on mute. Hold your slides. Here we go. I want to thank uh, yeah. the organizers for including our research team. Um, the focus of this presentation is going to be um, with underserved communities that have been overburdened by COVID-19. In particular, we're going to focus on Black neighborhoods, uh, which have had higher rates of contracting coronavirus than white neighborhoods. But at the same time, Blacks are less likely to want to be inoculated. So the key problem for us is how to boost vaccine uptake in Black neighborhoods. Okay, so what we've seen over the past year is a marked difference between Blacks and other groups in a willingness to be vaccinated. Um, this finding has been noted by many survey researchers. And Blacks, while one of the hardest hit racial groups, uh, they're unwilling to get vaccinated compared with other groups. Now, this persistent disparity also shows up in behavior. Uh, here we can see this is taken um, COVID vac vaccinations in the U.S. over the last month or so. Uh, we can see that Blacks are being vaccinated at a much lower rate as a proportion of the population. Uh, a number of scholars have pointed to the differences in access that mega centers provide for minorities. Uh, and one recent study from the University of Pittsburgh shows that Blacks are likely to live much further from vaccine hubs than whites, but this difference disappears when comparing distances from the nearest pharmacy uh, for both groups. Well, why are people hesitant? Standard reason offered for the difference in vaccination rates between Blacks and whites has to do with trust. Uh, and this has already been mentioned by several of the speakers. 
Uh, for Blacks, it's not surprising, given that governments at all levels are viewed as institutions that have sustained systemic racism. It's also understandable that Blacks are skeptical given uh, well-known cases of mis misconduct by the medical community. But there are a lot of other sources that may also lead Blacks uh, to take up uh, vaccinations uh, at, a, at a lower rate. This includes contradicting, contradictory messaging uh, by those inside and outside the communities, um, differences in assessing risk involved with inoculation and lack of access to vaccines. Well, what levers um, are, do we have available to us? Uh, so here's a set of levers that NIH has proposed. Um, these involve creating trust in governmental and, and uh, medical institutions. NIH also suggests getting leaders uh, and online influencers from, from localized communities to provide messaging of the vac the, that the vaccine is safe. Uh, such, such messaging could probably be used to um, build norms in which the vaccine uh, is easy to get and everybody wants to do so. Uh, nudges have also been recommended, including those that might reduce transaction costs. Uh, some of that's been touched on already today. Uh, might even think of gamification, like turning uh, vaccines into a lottery in which one wins a shot, uh, some, something that might be considered. Uh, finally, uh, fiddling with the location in which shots are given is recommended, but there's not a whole lot of information about what that means and what that means specifically with respect to underserved communities. So we're gonna focus on whether location matters, especially for uh, black communities. I might say that in changing these locations, it's, it fits uh, Cass Sustine's notion of something that's relatively easy. Okay, so why location? Well, look, once trust is broken, it's really hard to rebuild. And being able to rebuild trust in government agencies, the medical community overnight is going to be nearly impossible. Trying to get out the messaging is, is also difficult. Um, as uh, Cass Sestine noted earlier, there's a lot of competition for attention. You only have so much that you can give over to um, uh, those messages. And so it's difficult to get the messaging pushed through. But if different groups have different people and institutions they trust, we might be able to leverage that fact. And so are there locations that people trust? So we're gonna rely on a longitudinal study in which uh, part of the study is going to allow us to focus on location. So let me talk about the sample here. Now, this is not a convenient sample uh, of, uh, of, a nationally, uh, of a national sample. This is, this is a student sample. It is a convenient sample, but it has some interesting properties. First, the respondents uh, that we have in our study are from around the US. Um, they're not all located in Texas, even though the students that we draw on are primarily are, are from uh, Texas universities. Second, these respondents are um, better educated than most. Um, and this ought to be useful as people, uh, you know, these are gonna be people who are savvy about information. Okay. Third, this is an age cohort that takes more risks and um, may lead to demanding vaccine down down the road. So as a side note, um, this is the study takes place of a panel of students that have gone back some in some instances back to 2016. So it's a true panel, it's longitudinal. Uh, let me note that um, Rice is a private university. The other university involved is Texas A&M, which is a land grant university. And finally, Prairie View A&M, which is a historically black university, also a land grant university. Okay, we're gonna use data from wave four. So this particular study has four waves. Uh, and in wave four, we built in a um, embedded survey experiment. I'm also gonna leverage uh, the panel nature of the data to focus on questions of trust and vaccines. And finally, I'm gonna limit the analysis to just black white comparisons. So here I, we've assembled monthly data taken from various sources to show trends over time um, across racial groups, racial and ethnic groups. 
Uh, and then we can compare our student samples with those national samples. So respondents were asked about their willingness to take a COVID-19 vaccine when it became available. Uh, data from our study uh, are bolded. A couple of things to note, we find that our white and Hispanic respondents are willing to vaccinate at high rates, well above those reported in, in national samples. So it's not too surprising, as I noted, this group of people are well-educated and, uh, and, and, and young. What we do find, however, uh, is that black respondents in our sample trend in the same direction as the national sample. Over time, there's a steady decrease in the percentage of blacks willing to vaccinate. Moreover, uh, both in our uh, samples and nationally, there's a persistent gap between blacks and whites in the willingness to, to vaccinate. Okay, so what do we know about respondents' views, our respondents' views on vaccines? Well, we included a standard set of items uh, taken from Pew relating to harmful side effects and positive benefits. We scaled all the items accordingly. Uh, and then we have an index in which low values indicate being optimistic about vaccines and high values reflecting skepticism about vaccines. Well, what do we find? Uh, this figure compares blacks and whites across three different waves. This is from July, October, and January of this year. Uh, the figures are box and whisker plots, uh, and they clearly show this enormous chasm across time between blacks and whites, uh, and it's consistent. The differences are statistically significant just by the interocular test, as well as any statistic you want to throw at it. And across time, um, you know, blacks are relatively stable in terms of their um, skepticism about, um, about the vaccine. Okay, so now let me turn to the question of trust. So our expectation is that institutions and locations that are more highly trusted by blacks and whites uh, is gonna to lead to greater acceptance of getting an inoculation than locations that are not that trusted. So across all four waves, this is um, um, April, July, October, and again, December, uh, January of this year, um, we asked respondents about the degree to which they trusted various institutions. For example, we ask a respondent how much they trusted, let's say, the fire department. Uh, the bottom axis on this plot that I'm going to show you uh, notes the range in value from distrust on the left to complete trust on the right. Uh, I'm also going to, uh, we have four measures of trust reflecting our four waves of data, and that data is going to be uh, plotted reflecting tied, uh, being tied to each wave. And the reason I'm going through this is the figure gets fairly complicated once I show it. So for each wave, um, an item, I'll plot the mean trust value for blacks and whites. Blacks are represented by the black rectangles and whites by the blue circles. Uh, from this figure, you can see that there's little variance uh, for whites over time. Um, uh, for blacks, however, um, uh, trust in the fire department increases from April through January, and the gap between blacks and whites begins to disappear. So let me turn to the more complicated graph with a lot more information on it uh, and point out that I plotted some of our trust items and some of them we're going to be using uh, in our uh, subsequent analysis. I've got plotted six different items here. Uh, those on the left uh, show a moderate level of trust for local radio, CNN, and local public officials. Those on the ref right reflect greater trust in those institutions uh, that are noted. Two points are clear, uh, except for trust in CNN, there, there are large gaps in trust by black and white respondents. These are all statistically significant, except for some of the cases with CNN. Um, the second point is that the trust measures are relatively stable across time uh, for both groups. Now, the highest level of trust for Blacks is the local fire department. Trust in fire departments is commonly observed in the natural disasters literature since fire departments are often first responders. Um, this leads us to expect that local fire departments might be a good location, a useful location for administering vaccines. Okay, so I'm now going to turn to an embedded survey experiment. Uh, to this point, I've shown you know, that there are black-white differences in willingness to vaccinate, attitudes towards vaccines, and attitudes uh, about trust. 
So I'm going to rely on what we found with respect to trusting particular institutions. And our experiment's going to allow us to causally isolate any differences that we might observe in our results. And Rick, you have um, just over about three minutes left. Sorry, I missed a Got it. It'll work. Five minutes. Work. So our survey experiment is a single factor between subjects design. Uh, we draw on what we know about trust in institutions. We've selected three treatments. Respondents are randomly assigned uh, to one of the treatments then ask how likely they are to get a coronavirus shot. The wording is identical, except for the location. So for instance, your local radio station has announced that coronavirus vaccine shots are going to be made available to you next week. You'll be able to get your shots um, at your local fire department station or at your at various city and county health clinics or your local pharmacy. So this design should just allow us to see if location matters for our respondents. All right, so I've calculated the percentage of those who are very likely or somewhat likely to get the vaccine. It's broken out by treatment and by race. First thing to note is there's no difference across our white sample. Irrespective of the treatment, whites are likely to get the vaccine or indicate they're likely to get the vaccine ranging between 85 and 89%. Blacks, on the other hand, choose different locations at different rates. Surprisingly, and contrary to our expectations, the fire department treat treatment leads to the lowest willingness to get the vaccine. 40% are willing to get the vaccine. But if we move to the city county, this jumps to 49%, an almost 10% increase. And um, finally, the pharmacy treatment leads to a 56% rate of willingness to take up the vaccine, 16% over the fire department. As can be seen from the city, county, and pharmacy uh, comparisons, these are not statistically significantly different from one another. The primary difference lies with the fire department and the pharmacy comparison. So, uh, since we have a panel, we can go back to previous waves and ask whether people change their mind. So I calculated a really simple measure of whether or not they moved toward getting a vaccine or away from getting a vaccine. So imagine somebody indicated that they were very unlikely to get a vaccine in October. Uh, following the experimental manipulation, did that person move to being somewhat more likely? I can also capture the reverse. Somebody who's said that they were likely, did they move to being unlikely? Now I'm going to break this out by experimental treatment and by race. So think of this figure here as kind of a stacked bar reflecting the proportion moving toward inoculation and, and away from inoculation. Uh, the group at zero didn't change their mind. Uh, so what I'm picking up here is just the people who changed their mind. So cross treatment indicate the percentage of whites and blacks who changed their mind. Now, what we can see is the fire department intervention causes the greatest movement away from getting vaccinated, but only for blacks. Uh, there is little movement by whites. They're pretty much the same across all treatments. This is understandable. There's a ceiling effect for, black, uh, for, for whites on both, both sides, either getting or, or moving away. Um, but for blacks, over 45% are moving away from the inoculation once they're offered the opportunity to be vaccinated at the fire department. Now, most of the positive movement happens with city, county, and pharmacy um, interventions. So for Blacks, there's a 33% increase uh, in, the, in the city, county treatment, and a 36% increase in the pharmacy treatment. You can also see the decreases in, in with the red arrows. OK, so to conclude, fairly straightforward, simple experiment. What we find is that um, Blacks care um, about location and whites don't. Uh, it's surprising to see a simple survey experiment result in like 16% boost in willingness to take out the COVID-19 vaccine. This effect is isolated in a black sample, a group that's underserved and overburdened by the pandemic. Uh, as a side note, if we'd focused on observational data alone, correlated trust in institutions and, and et cetera, we might have recommended pushing vaccines to local fire departments, uh, but that's not what we're doing here. The current policies are pushing more vac vaccines out to mega hubs, but blacks, as we know, are not showing up at rates that match the population. If the intent is to treat communities that are not taking up the vaccine, our recommendation is switch the venue. 
efforts to move vaccines to pharmacies seem very promising. I think we have very clear data that this is useful. Our evidence suggests this is a positive route. And our sense is location is one of many levers that might be used in conjunction with messaging, building trust in providers, local leaders, and building local norms. Thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Rick. Great. Well, thank you to um, all the presenters. Really great, um, really great papers, and really kudos for all this great work under tough circumstances, um, particularly in experimental and, and field work. So, so thank. You sorry, may, may I may I address all the attendees? Sure. Go okay. Ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to use the opportunity for this. Um, I sent a message to the. Um, to all att uh, attendants. So I would like to ask if there is someone here from the World Health Organization or some, someone who has contacted them. So uh, I, cite, uh, I cited a summary study and, uh, and I also cited the current uh, WHO guideline on face masks. Um, if, uh, if someone has contact to them, uh, then I would appreciate if you, you, uh, you could contact, contact me or any of my quarters regarding this. Yeah, there are a few questions about that and suggestions. So. Um, great. Well, I, I collected a few um, a few comments from the chat. Um, a lot of them are uh, answered. So thank you for very responsive co-authors and authors in the chat. Um, but I, I collected a few. So I'll start out um, and maybe I'll call on a few people um, where I was able to note who asked um, asked a question. Um, Marta, we had a couple of questions about kind of the way that questions were framed and whether that might have strong effects on kind of how you thought about that. So, you know, like asking opt out versus confirm an appointment, right? Which is might sort of mean the same thing in practice, but could have sort of very different um, framing effects. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's that's an excellent, excellent question. And and I think we could try out these types of variations of the opt out framing, right, to make it like a, a harder opt out or a, or a weaker one. We followed um, the Gretchen Chapman's kind of framing, but I, I agree that, you know, we could try to to play with that. And maybe that would make the opt out effects, you know, larger than we find them here. So that would be a great, a great step forward. Yeah. Um, we had another question um, about the sort of takeaway that, you know, what matters is kind of what people are doing in your community, asking about, you know, their, um, I can't remember who asked this question. If you asked it, please feel free to chime in if I get this wrong. <laughs> but the comment was, in our work, we show that the descriptive norm for precautionary behavior, like social distancing, is eroding. So, like, while others getting the vaccine could increase take up, the relevant question or policy lever to Pull might be the perception that others are not getting the vaccine. And so how do we think about that? Yeah, so that's a great point. And I think the way we asked the question was as a function of how many are getting the vaccine. You could right. change the question and phrase it like how many are not getting the vaccine. Um, so I think, you know, both, both ways would be interesting to see and it would be interesting to see if it matters, right? And that we can also look at or try to get more data to look at that. Um, Anecdotally, we were talking to people from Israel where the vaccine is, is you know, it's becoming more and more available and they mm -hmm. seem to suggest that actually, yes, seeing more people getting the vaccine has somehow reduced the hesitancy among those that, that initially said they didn't want it. But those are anecdotal evidences and, you know, we could, we could chime in with more rigorous research here. Yeah, well, it was interesting. I mean, as, as levels increase generally, it will be interesting to see how that kind of flips. Um, yeah, and, and I think another important point is this free rider. Like we were concerned mm -hmm. as well, like if everyone or almost everyone in the community has it, then maybe people will say, well, you know, I don't need to be taking, you know, doing all of this work. Everyone has it already. We're fine. And so we don't see it in our data, but that could emerge as things evolve. Um, so those are interesting open questions to kind of keep our yeah. eyes out uh, for. Yeah, but, but we don't see it at all. I mean, like... Yeah. Everybody else has it, then you get you get really good rates of vaccine and even high enough to fight off the mutations. So this is really super uplifting, and there's no free riding, no indication at all of free riding. Yeah, yeah, that's an important finding. Um, do others have questions and want to speak up for Marta and Nora and the, um, the study?
feel free to go off mute. There are a lot of us, but we're not scary. Okay, well then I'll, I'll go on and I'll ask um, Andre a couple that I pulled and um, I'll read one from Phil Fan and Phil, if you wanna chime in, um, just please do so. So Phil asked, uh, how does the model account for past experience Bayesian inference if I tested positive for COVID or know someone close who has tested positive, my estimates may be closer to the doomsday scenario. And if I have escaped, um, been tested positive or simply don't know, I may be more optimistic. Yeah, thanks, uh, Aditi. We, um, th this is something we obviously uh, thought about. And uh, I think one of my co-authors uh, responded to the question in the chat. Um, we did collect a lot of information on that through the surveys that we administered during each wave. So people's perceptions about COVID, whether they knew anyone who had tested positive for COVID, whether they had tested positive for COVID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we do have a wealth of information um, to get a handle on that issue. But as I mentioned, right at the end, we've, uh, we've sketched out a full Bayesian hierarchical model in terms of beliefs. So the idea is that the posterior for um, wave one serves as the prior for wave two. And then the, um, the posterior of waves one and two serve as the prior for wave three and so on and so on and so on. That'll allow us to get a lot of traction, as I mentioned, in terms of the different belief frames we put together, as well as the evolution of uh, the pandemic and, uh, and, and time just generally over the course of the study. Because obviously that affects um, belief forecasting horizons. You know, if you're trying to figure out how many deaths there will be on the 1st of December, uh, at the end of May, that's a six month forecasting horizon. If you're doing that at the end of October, that's a one month forecasting horizon. So, you know, we, we, we are very cognizant of all of those issues and we're, we're gonna approach them with the appropriate statistical tools to try and unpack them. Great, and um, Phil, I don't know if you're still on, did you have, do you have any um, follow-up questions, comments? Okay, I'll keep going. I can't see Phil in my Zoom screen. So uh, I had a question for you, um, Andre, too. So, you know, you mentioned this kind of first, like no differences in risk preferences over the pandemic. Um, and also so that- So th those were intertemporal risk preferences. Right. We noticed uh, a few differences in atemporal risk preferences um, and obviously dramatic differences pre-pandemic and during pre the pandemic. But the intertemporal risk Dur preferences were sort of declining over time, but the confidence intervals are big. We find, we find some pretty interesting differences by ethnicity in terms of intertemporal mm -hmm. risk attitudes, but not as a function of time. And so how, how um, should we think about that and this kind of intertemporal risk aversion in terms of you know, policy design? Like what is an example of sort of an application where we might want to um, incorporate that sure. kind of learning? Sure. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the assumption of additive separability uh, effectively ties risk and time preferences at the hip in the sense that the, the coefficient of atemporal risk aversion is equal to the inverse of the elas intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So there, there's a long theoretical uh, uh, literature or uh, uh, a theoretical literature with a long lineage that, for example, um, uh, models habit formation and uh, addiction being one of the exemplars. And that necessitates uh, a break from the standard additive separability assumption. So, you know, if we are interested in modeling uh, changes in people's uh, temporal risk profiles, we really need tasks to be able to elicit those preferences. And even though we found in our particular American sample that there weren't any particular differences over time, that's not to say they wouldn't be elsewhere. I think Glenn probably wants to chime in the, a little the, bit there the, too. The answer, uh, Aditu was asking about policy. And the, the point is that intertemporal risk preferences say that people want value steady uh, expectations of vaccines or tests over time as distinct from the atemporal reducing of the variability when they actually go to get them. So there is great value in uh, policies that deal with predictability over time. So as even your expectations from. about where to get it, how to get it, how it works, exactly. all of those. Exactly, predictability over time is a dimension of the, the welfare evaluation of the policy 
that is not otherwise missed if you impose intertemporal risk neutrality. That's great. Great, and I think so one other, one last question, which is um, I think sort of based on Rick's presentation, but also others can, other panelists can, um, can weigh in too. So, you know, there was a comment about kind of understanding why people care about um, location and kind of knowing the, um, you know, trust. And so obviously there's this sort of long um, historical, social, communal, and even religious um, predicates to trust that could be teased out. So there's sort of how do we think about you know, what um, sort of trust in that context? And then somebody else asked, you know, do we know of any work or have you thought about you know, work that unpacks this trust and sort of tries to figure out specifically what it is um, that the respondents don't, don't trust and how we might address that? Well, fortunately, we have, um, you know, a longitudinal panel structure to our data, and we've asked an enormous number of questions and put people through incentivized games um, through, uh, you know, from, from the get-go of the study. This thing that we did in January, we deliberately kept it short because we were worried about panel attrition. Um, and so we decided to minimize the set of things that we would include in that panel or in, in that wave of the data. Uh, we're really very well aware of, of um, all the factors that might intervene uh, with, you know, trust. But, but, but again, you know, the point is that trust is a hard thing to change. You can't just yeah. go out and say, Oh no, we're sorry. You know, we didn't mean it. Tuskegee was a mistake. Sorry, uh, that's not going to have you know much of an effect on people, um, especially when it's deeply ingrained. So, are there other things that we can search for? And I completely agree that that changing the costs, the convenience, uh, you know, all of those things that are kind of the standard repertoire of 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 you know of economics, it, it, you know, is useful. But what's really impressive is that we can get this effect uh, with, with very little. And it's kind of uplifting to see that, you know, th there's an investment now in moving vaccines into pharmacies or other locations. And I think this is an understanding that there are huge barriers to entry uh, for people to get vaccines. And if you, if you really want to serve communities, uh, that have been underserved, then you better go to them and not expect them to come to you. Now, in the next wave of the data, yes, we're going to continue to try and unpack all of this, and we're going to, you know, see wh where else we can go. But this was this was a first cut. Rick, well, thank you. you. Can I a quick comment on the effect of the blacks of churches? I would have thought that's dramatic in the, in the southeast. You don't seem to get strong results there. Well, we, we didn't include the church's stuff, you know. So this, so think about the sample. So this sample is kids who are between 19 and 24. Uh, they're college students. Okay. Uh, we do have measures of religiosity, and we have not built those into these models yet. I'm leery sometimes when I do a very simple survey experiment to... Um, to throw in many covariates on the right-hand side. I mean, we've done we've done a little of that, but uh, you know, I think these are all things that you know, a lot of good suggestions of things that we might explore. Right now, the question is whether you know this is something that we ought to be pushing out uh, for policy adoption. Yeah, my question was probably more for non-college black. So your your point's well taken. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much to um, all the presenters and um, everybody for your questions and active engagement on the chat. Um, lots um, of really interesting, immediately policy relevant um, and deeper uh, insights into behavior around these topics. So thank you so much again. Um, and uh, Mario, I'll hand it back over to you. Uh, thank you so much Matt, to, to, to all of the authors and, and to Aditi again for, uh, for chairing the session. We'll take a short break Three minutes, we'll be back in uh, three minutes at 11.40 Eastern uh, for our next segment, uh, a panel session on improving pandemic response with experiments and behavioral economics. Thanks, see you soon.
Welcome back. Uh, we will now move to the last segment of today's program, uh, a panel session on improving pandemic response with experiments and behavioral economics. We have five uh, extraordinary speakers led by Professor Sunita Sa. Uh, Sunita Sa is the KPMG Professor of Management Studies at the University of Cambridge Judge Business School and also Associate Professor of Management and Organizations at Cornell University in the Johnson Graduate School of Management. Professor Sa is a physician turned organizational psychologist. She's She's pretty unbelievable. Uh, she's pretty amazing. She published extensively uh, on uh, a range of topics uh, from uh, uh, advisor advisee relationships to medical decision making, trust, conflict of interest, among others. She served as a commissioner on the National Commission on Forensic Science for the US Department of Justice. More recently, during the pandemic, her work has examined people's intent to take vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, misinformation on vaccines, and how to engage communities to help address the pandemic. We're very fortunate to have her as part of our conference. Take it away, Sunita. Hey, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here as one of the five panelists to discuss how we improve our responses to pandemics. I also have the pleasure of introducing the other four panelists who bring a great deal of expertise. So uh, we have uh, Wendy Bruin de Brun. She is the Provost uh, Professor of Public Policy, Psychology and Behavioral Science at the University of Southern California's Price School of Public Policy and the Department of Psychology. And her research aims to inform how people make healthcare decisions, assess risk and protect themselves. And she is currently serving on uh, the US National Academy of Sciences panel on mask use and respiratory health. We have uh, Nicholas Papageorge, uh, who is the Broadus Mitchell Associate Professor of Economics and Associate Director of the Poverty and Inequality Lab at Johns Hopkins University. And he has worked on COVID-19 related issues and the importance of incorporating behavior into epidemiological modeling to inform policy. And he also draws from past pan, um, epidemics to inform his research. Uh, next up is Johannes uh, Husfer assistant professor of economics at Stockholm University, who wrote uh, a recent article published in Science with Jessica Metcalf called, Which Interventions Work Best in a Pandemic? We can explore, exploit randomized controlled trials, compartmental models, and spillovers. We'll look forward to hearing about that. And finally, we have Alison Buttenheim, who is an associate professor of nursing and health policy, the Silverstein Chair of Go Global and Women's Health, and the scientific director of the Center of Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. And she is a leading expert in the application of behavioral economics to infectious disease prevention. Her research agenda is focused on vaccine acceptance as well as other things. And she served on the National Academy's panel of the equitable allocation of coronavirus uh, vaccine in 2020. So each of uh, the five panelists will present some of their research or key messages for a few minutes, and then we will have a discussion. And the focus of today's panel is on how we can improve the pandemic response. Given the mishandling of the pandemic from multiple countries, we have plenty to learn and, and certainly can do better. But before I go into what we can improve, I do want to mention one response that was pretty spectacular, and that was the unprecedented speed of the development of a number of COVID-19 vaccines and with high efficacy. So of course now there are issues of distribution and discussions over equity and how to allocate the vaccine. And I'm sure some of the panelists will speak about that. Um, it's likely Alison, but uh, those issues assume that everybody wants it, everybody desires it to the same level. And as we've heard in some of the talks earlier today, uh, there's a pretty robust pattern appearing in the literature regarding certain groups that are hesitant to take the vaccine. And what's interesting about these groups that they are quite different from the demographics of the, the normal or the usual uh, anti vaxxers Share my screen once again. And um, the different diverse groups, we already heard minorities, particularly black Americans um, are less likely to take it than white Americans and other minorities. A group that might be more surprising are healthcare workers 
You might think that they might trust the healthcare system more, trust the vaccine more, but uh, several recent studies are showing that's not, um, that's not true. And they may be even more hesitant and essential workers. And what's most interesting about these groups are that these groups are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So the more likely to contract COVID-19 and they have higher mortality and morbidity rates. So it's important that we address um, these particular groups. There are others, uh, Republicans, rural residents, and there are, of course, differences in age and education. In my own uh, research I conducted with a medical student um, at Cambridge University, we examined university students and we were particularly interested in how race, both race, ethnicity, and working in healthcare would affect uh, vaccine hesitancy. Now, the way that we did this is that we looked at medical students who are patient facing, so clinical students, medical students in their clinical years, and compared them with other university students. And what we see is that Although white students are overall more vaccine confident, they are not at all hesitant in larger proportions than um, non-white students. This difference due to race is amplified for students with clinical exposure, so students in their clinical practice years. And this pattern seems specific to the COVID-19 vaccine. We didn't see it for the flu vaccine. And there are a number of possibilities for this pattern. So notably, there's a lack of representation of minorities in COVID-19 vaccination trials. And students that are clinical patient facing might be more aware of that. And it could lead to this wait and see approach um, of others in their communities to see how they do. But it's especially concerning if non-white healthcare workers are skeptical as it could mean they're less likely to reassure their communities. And we know that when deciding to take a vaccine, people trust their healthcare providers the most. And if your own healthcare provider is not enthusiastic, then that's going to have an impact. So it's really essential that we find ways to mitigate the concerns of non-white healthcare workers. With that, I wanna pass on to our second panelist, uh, Wendy. Thank you, Sunita. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me share my slides. Let's see. So um, you asked me to, uh, let's see. You asked me to talk about um, uh, vaccine adoption. And um, as you know, um, uh, or may not know, uh, at the University of Southern California, we have been running a national longitudinal study of um, 7,000 Americans since March 10th of 2020 to track people's risk perceptions, protective behaviors, uh, such as mask use and social distancing, as well as vaccine hesitancy. And so on this slide, you see um, reported uh, likelihood of getting the coronavirus vaccine if it's available. It was about 83% in April 2020 when we started asking this question. It has dropped to 63% in December of 2020, and it's still that low. And uh, that means that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, we should find out what's going on here and, and uh, there may be a need for psychological insights and behavioral insights to be uh, incorporated in the uh, rollout of the vaccine uh, because once enough vaccines are available, we want to make sure that um, everybody uh, gets back or as many people as possible get vaccinated. Um, so here are some behavioral insights from my own work and that of others on vaccines, not necessarily COVID vaccines that may uh, inform the uh, uh, vaccine uh, um, distribution and, and rollout and communications. First, uh, it's important to make it understandable communications about the vaccine. Uh, in a study I conducted when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I worked with Julie Downs on a project on uh, parents' decision-making about vaccinating their children for MMR. And we found that parents, especially parents who are vaccine hesitant, um, looked uh, online using search terms that were more simple than parents who are uh, um, not as vaccine hesitant. And if you use simple, at the time, if you use simple search terms to look for vaccine information, you were more likely to land on anti-vaccine websites than on the CDC websites. I'm not sure that that is currently still true with Google's, Google's algorithms, but I think a uh, uh, takeaway here is that if you want to make, uh, uh, reach 
parents who are vaccine or people who are vaccine hesitant, you may use use simple language so that they find your information or if they find it that they understand and find it compelling. Um, it's also important to make it easy to get vaccinated. Um, a seminal study by Gretchen Chapman and colleagues found that if you invite people to get vaccinated and there's an appointment included in the invitation, people are more likely to get vaccinated than if, they, if the invitation says call and make an appointment. And what's cool about this is that even if people can't make the appointment that's part of the invitation, they will call and reschedule and still get vaccinated, or at least they're likely to do so. It's also important to make it compelling communications about the vaccine. Um, uh, my work and that of others has suggested that for the flu vaccine, uh, people may be less swayed by facts and more by personal stories, especially if they have low numeracy. And uh, the anti-vaccine um, campaigns usually use personal stories about side effects and problems with the vaccine, but um, we should be sharing personal stories about people who have little to no side effects to make uh, information about vaccines compelling. It's also important to make vaccination the norm. Um, in a recent study on the uh, seasonal flu vaccine, I found that people's perceptions of how many of their friends and family are getting vaccinated for the seasonal flu predicts their own flu vaccination behavior a year later, even after accounting for their own past vaccination behavior, suggesting that people look to others around them perhaps for information about whether or not they themselves should get vaccinated. So if you make um, vaccines available in the community that would make it easy, so addressing point two, but then you can also, people can also see that others around them are getting vaccinated and, and, and uh, follow others in their community. In addition to that, you could also make it more visible if others are getting vaccinated by giving people stickers if they got vaccinated, just like we have done with voting, and that makes a difference. That you can people then can see that others in their community got community got vaccinated, um, and perhaps uh, encourage selfies on social media to to show that you've gotten vaccinated. Uh, that may make it more visible and. Um, create the social norm. It's also important to make the vaccine rollout fair and transparent. Um, in a study that is currently, that we're still writing up, uh, we have found, we build on the uh, marketing literature, which suggests that if there's a product that people want and um, they don't get that product because of limited availability, people may no longer want that product and even act out against the company. Our paper suggests that maybe a similar pattern with the vaccines, uh, that if they see others getting vaccinated before them, where they think those others should not be vaccinated before them, that may make people upset, make them less willing to get the vaccine later, and even uh, make them stop social distancing. Um, generally, the main point uh, of uh, psychology and behavioral science is it's important to understand your audience. Different people may have different barriers to uh, taking the vaccine, including ones on this slide. And it's important to understand which uh, of these issues uh, are the most uh, common and uh, then develop interventions that address those. Thank you. Okay, we can go to Nick. Hi, can I share my screen? Okay. Uh, I just, I guess I'll just show, share my desktop. Can people see these slides? Great. Okay. Uh, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, the perspective I'll emphasize for a couple of minutes is I think complementary to what I've seen here, and in many cases, probably overlaps with everyone else's thinking. Uh, we've got to think about behavior when developing policy related to a pandemic. Uh, I don't know how much of a behavioral economist I am, and I tend to run experiments through counterfactual policy simulations of structural models or using structural models. But I hope you know <clears throat> I'm not Im immediately disqualified uh, from this panel. Uh, so I'll briefly tell you what my concerns are. Uh, about a couple of bits of research I'm, I'm involved with, uh, what I see as modeling uh, inadequacies and where I think my own research is going in case anyone cares. Uh, so to provide an illustration of failing to take behavior into account, we know that there have been calls to not shift uh, behavior since uh, once you're vaccinated. I'm not even sure if that's the optimal message, especially if the goal is to get 
people to want to be uh, vaccinated. Uh, moreover, <clears throat> this is what people are actually doing. These are Twitter posts from of screenshots of a gay sex and dating app called Grindr, uh, where people are advertising their vaccination status, presumably in order to find someone to have uh, sex with. Uh, maybe we think that's frivolous and reckless. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it's a point one can make. It, I think this is emblematic of what for me has been a terribly frustrating uh, disconnect between pandemic policy, including messaging, and the reality of human behavior. Uh, the pandemic and policies meant to combat it have been uh, very difficult uh, for some people, like existentially difficult. So here's a food line. I don't know if people having trouble putting food on the table are going to shelter in place uh, or support other measures that make public health completely paramount. Uh, and keep in mind, I'm not endorsing any particular view or preference or behavior. I'm just noting the way people are facing these trade-offs. And these are not anecdotes. So I wrote a, bl a blog post in like March about poverty and self-protecting behavior uh, with a sociologist and a student uh, of mine in economics. And we speculated that low-income people would face circumstances like uncomfortable housing, uh, no outside space at home, and ability to telework, and so on. And, and that would mean they would have trouble social distancing. Um, this isn't about patting ourselves on the back for being you know, sort of prescient in a, broad, a blog post. I think uh, I want to note that there should be more social scientists in the room from the, from the get-go because we understand like behavior. That's what we are trained to do. Anyways, a group of economists and I went and collected data from six different countries and we corroborated these initial speculations. The paper is now published. Uh, here's a key figure that shows that higher income uh, is, is predictive of increases in self-protecting behaviors. Here I have any behavior change, increases in hand washing, increases in social distancing. Uh, the paper goes on to argue that some of the factors I mentioned earlier can help to explain these gradients. And this is not about so noting that rich people have it better, there's policies we could consider. For example, low-income people tend not to have outside space at home, uh, which predicts less social distancing. So maybe opening parks might have been like a really important thing to have done uh, early on. Uh, but you know that sounded silly when it marched to some people, I think. Um, and yet, you know, the messaging is targeted towards people who could work and exist comfortably at home for quite a while. Do we remember all the sourdough starters we were supposed to get um, uh, going on? Um, so where does that leave us? Uh, okay, so in my view, uh, behavior drives a pandemic. Uh, behavior is driven by preferences, circumstances, and constraints. Uh, the way people are gonna uh, address a health wealth trade-off, information and beliefs, probably messaging, which I think is more of a focus here. Uh, and then endogenous responses to policy. Uh, the pandemic is going to have uh, unequal burdens on uh, people uh, from different uh, socio-demographic uh, groups, uh, and so are the policies to curb it, which is sort of like a double whammy if you're poor, right? Um, so whether or not we find non-compliance justified, uh, and we can wring our hands uh, as much as we want, I think assuming full compliance is not the best idea. Unfortunately, models to date used to evaluate uh, pandemic policy have a lot of shortcomings and I'll put myself into these groups. Uh, so micro reduced form, the types of things that I do show tons of heterogeneity and maybe some individual responses to policy if you go causal, um, but there's no formal link uh, between those responses and to the sort of aggregate spread of illness. Um, then there's micro structural, which presumably could do that. Um, I've been involved in that uh, with HIV, but there's not a whole lot of this around. And it turns out that for HIV, it's a lot easier to do it because you don't have to worry in a developing country about aggregate economic effects, like changes to wages, employment, or output. Um, and that's something you're going to have to worry about uh, with COVID, which makes things a lot more difficult. So. Uh, economic epidemiology kind of came in, uh, it's a tiny uh, area, but basically they uh, have these macro style uh, uh, representative agent types of models uh, that can incorporate some kind of an epidemiological process. So people are either young or old and that's it. So there's not enough heterogeneity in these models uh, and epi people hate them because they're far too simplistic. They call it a basic model and the epi people think it's a stupid model. Uh, and so, uh, you know, everyone's, you know, the fists are flying. I've been in these talks. Uh, they're interesting. Okay. Uh, and, and epi models, on the other hand, um, and I'm glad I'm not in person in case there's anyone here. They're very rich, but they don't incorporate behavior change and they don't incorporate health wealth trade-offs. So if you fail to do that, not only are you not going to be able to sort of think about how people are trading off health or wealth or how society should, you're going to just get disease spread uh, in the medium term or in the long term wrong, because you're not accounting for how people are uh, reacting. 
uh, okay, so what am I doing about it in case anyone cares? Uh, I'm still collecting data uh, to figure out what types of heterogeneity we need in models. Uh, I'm also continuing to use HIV uh, AIDS as, uh, as an historical analogy. Uh, I'm looking right now at sociodemographic differences in compliance. Uh, so engaging in behaviors that are not only good for your own health, but are, have positive externalities. So you think about uh, virus repressing uh, uh, medication that has side effects uh, across like education groups as sort of a dynamic choice that might be related to things like labor supply. So, uh, you know, sort of the, the key idea there is if you're poor, uh, you can't do the side effects thing uh, because you need to work, uh, which I think has uh, an analogy for today. And then um, also a few of us uh, masochists, I won't name names, uh, at Hopkins have started to put together a working group to actually see if we can build models uh, used for pandemic policy evaluation that would be taken seriously by economists and epidemiologists. Uh, Obviously, it has to start from a place of mutual respect. Uh, it's not clear if we could do it. It's very complicated. Uh, uh, and it's going to amount to whether or not we can um, compromise, so give up parts of our own models that we love. And uh, so, you know, stay tuned. Uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. We'll move to our next uh, panelist, Johannes. Unmute. Yes, I am on mute. Sorry. Uh, let me share my screen. Could everybody see my screen just now? When it yeah, if it was up briefly, honest. There it is. Can't see you now. Okay, fantastic. Can you see the slide switch? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this and thanks for having me. It's been really interesting to listen to everyone else. So I'm briefly going to talk about two things uh, that I've been involved with. Uh, and, and both of them are a little bit meta to the question around how behavioral science intersects with the pandemic. Um, one is thinking about how people respond to measures that governments put in place. Um, and that could be behavioral measures or it could be harder measures. And the other is how we might evaluate measures. So I'll start with the one that's shown on the left here that's uh, with a whole bunch of people um, from various institutions. Um, and we, when the pandemic started in spring of last year, we ran a large international survey. Um, and I'll briefly talk about the results from that. And then I'll uh, summarize the uh, the other paper that's shown on the right here that's joined with Jessica Metcalf, my colleague, my former colleague at Princeton, uh, on how we might evaluate interventions. Um, so starting with the one on the left, um, when things started getting really bad in March and April of last year, uh, we put together a short survey on people's perceptions and behaviors uh, in relation to COVID. And we had a really lovely uh, Twitter response to a request that we sent out for translation. So volunteers, I think some of whom are uh, on this call, um, translated our survey into 69 languages. And within a very, very short period of time, we had about 110,000 or so responses from around the world. So the data that I'm going to show you comes from 58 countries and just over 100,000 people. Um, most of the sampling here was convenient sampling. Um, we verified it later with some uh, representative samples, but um, the, even the convenient samples look representative according to observables. And our question was how people respond themselves and how they perceive both their governments and their fellow citizens to be responding. And here's uh, a graph that summarizes our results a little bit. So on the left, you can see bars that indicate the share of people that uh, think uh, certain behaviors should be observed. So not engaging in silver social gatherings, handshakes were still a big thing at the time, uh, store closures and so on. So many people around the world thought that these things should be done. But at the same time, and you can see that on the right, most people think that their fellow citizens uh, don't think that. So people underestimate the degree to which other people think that these behaviors should be observed, even though they themselves uh, think hold those views very strongly. Um, and this is true for the perception of other people's behaviors as well as 
other people's attitudes, as well as government action. So most people have a pessimistic view of whether governments are doing enough. A lot of people think that governments aren't doing enough. And so um, the, we, we then combine this data with um, a, an index on the stringency of government measures around the world. So the timing was fortuitous here because this was a time when cases grew quite a lot. So from the beginning of our two week or so survey window to the end, there was about a quadrupling or quintupling of cases around the world. And in line with that, a lot of governments became very active. And so lots of measures came into place. And so in a number of different analyses, uh, mostly using panel data, but including some event studies, we can look at what happens when governments tighten restrictions. And so here's maybe the most salient example, right in the middle of our survey period at the end of March, the UK government put in a lockdown and that happened very dramatically. Boris Johnson made an announcement one evening and then there was a lockdown the next morning. And we see, because we had a lot of data coming in during that time, a very dramatic response uh, to the perception among people in the UK whether the government reaction to the pandemic is sufficient. So what you're seeing here is the people's views that the government reaction is insufficient and the black line shows the change from before the lockdown came into place to immediately after. So you can see that changes very dramatically. And in line with that on the right, we have a mental health index so a worries measure um, and that also goes down. So the, the finding here is, and that also holds up in a number of other measures that when governments put in place more stringent measures, uh, people actually feel better rather than worse. So this is maybe contradicting the, uh, the view that um, people suffer greatly from the lockdown. Certainly when, they, when the lockdowns came into place, if anything, that was a positive thing for people's mental health, um, at least in this particular setting. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show on the first paper. And then the, the second paper, um, a little bit of a meta paper in the sense that Jess and I, uh, Jess is an epidemiologist at Princeton, were struck by the fact that of course we test vaccines before we deploy them, but we don't systematically test many other measures. Um, and that's true for both behavioral measures you know, small scale things to encourage people to engage in social distancing, but also much tougher measures like lockdowns uh, that have really dramatic consequences and yet they're not tested in the same rigorous way that um, vaccines are. And um, we thought for a long time about various reasons why that might be true and in the end decided that many of those reasons really don't hold water and so in the end we wrote down some ways in which these measures could be tested. And in particular, it occurred to us that when many of these measures are deployed, there isn't really a correct time when that's, when that's happening. So, you know, a lockdown comes into place on Wednesday or Thursday, the difference between that isn't so large. Um, and the timing of these, of these actions could be used to actually understand what effects they have. And so the stylized example that I'm going to briefly walk you through um, illustrates how that could happen. So on the right here, you can see uh, how a pandemic develops in terms of the proportion of people who are currently infected in a population, either when it's uh, let loose without any restrictions, that's the red curve here, or when an intervention is in place, such as a lockdown for the entire duration, that's the blue curve. So it gets spread out in time, but the overall size is smaller. Um, and then the, the dashed lines here denote periods where uh, that intervention is tightened or loosened periodically. And so we think about tightening or loosening here. You could also think about uh, just bringing it into play sooner in, other, in some regions than in others or ending it sooner in some regions than in others. Here we're thinking of, about tightening and loosening. So loosening is shown up here in this first graph. If you loosen this intervention, uh, in this period here that's denoted with one, you'll have a stronger response. Uh, if you loosen it uh, in period two, you also have somewhat of a stronger response, same in period three. If you tighten it further, um, so imagine making a lockdown more dramatic, uh, you can reduce the size somewhat that's shown here with a uh, graph that's in an, an indistinguishable shade of blue. Um, same if you loosen it here, if you tighten it here in the second period and so on. So um, 
using this these systematic tightenings and loosenings in a randomized fashion would be relatively easy uh, as a mechanism to get at um, the effects of these measures. And in addition to uh, studying the spread, uh, you can get at the final size. So what's shown here is the final size. It's the total number of infections or the share of the population ever infected. And uh, that will vary with the period in which you deploy these tightenings and loosenings. And it turns out that because um, in, an, in an entirely susceptible population, like is the case for COVID, um, the, the way in which the pandemic spreads is um, very well described by these SIR models or SEIR models. Um, and those are governed by very few parameters. And so that means with very little measurement, um, you can estimate uh, treatment effects here. So including just one measurement after you deploy or tighten or loosen the intervention, uh, you can get at the relative transmission rates that are induced in the control versus the treatment condition. So in, briefly, what this is saying is that it's actually pretty easy to measure the impacts of um, measures that we deploy against the pandemic. And it's surprising that that's not being done more like it's being done for vaccines. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. We'll um, move on now to Alison. Great, thanks. Um, so like a lot of you, I've been on a zillion of these kind of events over the last several weeks and months and always curious sort of who's behind that little participant number. I'm, I'm thrilled to see that we still have about 200 of the 300 folks that tuned in for CAST this morning. Um, but we've, we've thrown together a really quick poll, um, very imprecise, but it just asks if you are more kind of research oriented in your work as a participant here today or practitioner oriented. So Jamie, if you could launch that poll um, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll frame why I'm asking that. So. Um, I'm guessing many of our participants today um, and many of our attendees maybe as well are getting a lot of questions from practitioners, frontline public health officials, uh, vaccinator um, organizations, health systems, health insurance companies, community-based organizations asking for help. And uh, what that usually looks like is not could you come do an RCT with us to discover the best way to do something, right? It's like, tell us what to do. What is the best message? What is the best intervention? What's the playbook? Give us the evidence. Um, and so I wanted to, to sort of frame my, my comments around uh, how hard that is to do right now and some ways that um, we're, we're trying to kind of iteratively use uh, really light touch like online experiments to inform hopefully some A-B testing we can do with practitioners. So um, I don't know, Jamie, how we get to see the results. Um, I don't know if you can throw those up or maybe everyone else is seeing them and I'm not, um, but what is our split of our, of our folks here? And you can decide before they go up what your, what your prior is on, on our split. Jamie says it should be popping up on our screen. I'm not seeing it. Well, I'll go ahead. Okay, 83% researcher, 18% practitioner. Okay, so we're, so we're primarily the behavioral scientists being asked uh, for, for this info from practitioners and the practitioners are unfortunately less, less represented here. Okay, that's, that's helpful uh, uh, level setting. Oops, let me go back up here. Okay, so um, this is work that I've been doing with Gretchen Chapman, who's been referenced several times today already, uh, fantastic vaccine acceptance and, and general um, health psychology researcher at Carnegie Mellon. We are both part of the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics at Penn, and we have an initiative called Bravo, Behavioral Research Advancing Vaccine Acceptance and Optimal Delivery, basically an umbrella under which to park all of these um, sort of requests for information that we're trying to build uh, scientific inquiry around. And one of the big questions we're getting from, again, healthcare systems, uh, community-based organizations, public health officials, is um, how do we figure out who's hesitant or sort of where intentions are in our population? Basically, how are people answering this question of, you know, do you plan to get the vaccine once eligible? And it occurred to Gretchen and, and me, you know, based on prior research, that how we asked that question was probably really, really important. So we just ran a couple of NTARC studies. This is the most recent and largest one where we varied the response categories to that 
that question. Um, this will not surprise folks at similar research in other domains. But when we ask it just with a yes, no response category, we have about 32% of people saying no, they don't plan to get vaccinated. And that's in line with some of the other um, attitudinal or intention data people have, have shown uh, earlier today. When we add a couple of other yes categories, so when we expand the choice set with yes answers, so yes and I plan to encourage friends and family to vaccinate, that's kind of like a super yes, or yes but I'll plan, uh, I, wait, I plan to wait until later in the year, we actually can shift people away from that hard no. Um, so that drops to about 17% and you can see how the, the uh, distribution is across those expanded yes choices. We were also curious about adding a, a no. Um, this is sort of a no but, so a softer no than the hard no. And uh, when, we, when we do that, we continue to shift people away from the hard no. And even the sum of the no and the, and the softer no is still a little bit less than, uh, than the, in the experience. So um, these are only intentions. This could just be a measurement issue and, and measurement's important here. Um, but in terms of next steps, Gretchen and I are also just really interested in whether the presentation of this choice set actually is an intervention, right? Can we sort of shift people's um, identity or, or, or frame about where they actually stand on their back intentions by how we present choice sets? Um, so we're hoping that these, these uh, results are sort of intriguing enough to take back to our, our partners and say, there's actually you know, a couple different ways we could do this. Um, let's, let's try both. A second um, set of, of inquiries that we have are around the idea of um, this what's your why, right? Sort of asking people their reasons for vaccinating, both to use with other people, sort of, to, sort of other people can hear, especially peers or vaccine validators why people are vaccinating, but again also as an intervention in a sort of saying is believing type frame, right? So when you get someone to articulate their reasons for vaccinating, does that actually shift their intentions? Um, so again, this is just mTurkers. Um, we randomly assign folks <clears throat> to one of three interventions. In the first one, they actually respond to this what's your why prime. So they respond to the question above, they have just a window, they can type in an answer, they can leave it blank, they can type garbage, many people do. Um, a second group reads a sort of curated random selection of responses from a previous running of the, of the survey. So they get to see what a couple of other people have said about what's your why. And then we have just an attention control where they type in some responses to sort of, uh, you know, why do you want to save, uh, you know, save money for the future? Um, just so they're, they're doing another activity like that. Um, again, you might want to sort of guess some, some, some priors here. Um, we've broken it down here by white and non-white respondents because the results are interesting. We also have interesting white versus non-white on the, on the choice set. Um, probably don't have time to go into. But with all respondents um, in the sample, we can, we can lift intentions. This is on a five-point scale, um, about, uh, about half a point um, relative to the financial savings attention control um, with the what's your why prime. So responding to that question has about a, has about a half a point boost on a five-point scale. That effect, though, is all with our white respondents. Um, in fact, it's even a little, a little wider, um, close to three quarters of a point um, relative to the, to the control prime. And very small n here. Again, we're, we're rerunning these with larger samples, but a sort of messier, more interesting, uh, more complex uh, distribution of answers there for, for non-white respondents with um, the reading other people's what's your why responses potentially being, uh, being more motivating. Um, so again, our, our goal here, we, we know these are only intentions. Obviously, it would be much more interesting to see actual vaccination behavior after some of these interventions. But our, our idea is to uh, build a sort of a, a use case and, uh, and motivation for our many, many practitioners who just want the answer um, to make the case for doing some experimentation um, to, to help move the needle on both understanding where people are and designing sort of concierge to journeys um, to, to get them to, uh, to that vaccination appointment if, if that's their choice. Um, let me stop there. I think there's so much interesting stuff across all the, all the presenters and I, I hope we can have a robust discussion. Thank you very much. This uh, was fascinating information and wonderful work being done by all our panelists here. So um, I do want to open it up to questions. So the panelists feel free to ask the other panelists questions and everyone else feel free to put uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, I have a couple of questions that have already come through the chat. So for Nick, um, there's been some questions about um, your simulations. Sorry, Johannes, about your uh, intervention sim simulations. 
Would these simulations change once people who had coronavirus get infected again by a mutation? Yeah, so that was Nora. I've just been uh, debating back and forth with Nora in the in the chat, which hopefully everyone can see. So yes, in the sense that um, the the stylized curve that I showed would change, like the curve that we show for the non-intervention scenario is one where there's a fully susceptible population and the virus tears through it just once and um, there aren't mutations. But the, crucially, the treatment effect estimation is independent of that. It just depends what the share of susceptibles are. And if you have a new strain, then that simply leads to an increase in the share of susceptibles, because some of the previously infected are now also again susceptible. And that's you can estimate treatment effects independently of where in the pandemic you are. Um, so just the ratio of the infected at a given time point in treatment to control areas gives you a, um, the ratio, the log ratio of the um, transmission parameters um, under some mild assumptions. So that's uh, that's sort of the basic point. And uh, I mean, this can be complicated in various ways. So for example, um, like this is assuming complete independence of the treatment and control areas. And so you, if you want to do this carefully, you would probably want to think very hard about spillovers. Um, either have regions that are far enough apart to not have a lot of spillovers or to actually um, model them explicitly and randomize with spatial variation that allows you to identify them. Thank you. I actually also had a question for you um, about your, your other work and this perception difference between self and others. And I wondered whether you looked at which one, of, when you mentioned that we underestimate what others are doing, what is the accuracy? Are we also overestimating what we are doing? Where, where does that gap come from? Is it really um, an underestimation or are they being more accurate about other people and less accurate about ourselves? Right. So it does seem to be an underestimation of what others are doing. So with the allowance that you have to believe what people are saying. But so if you compare what people report they themselves are doing with what they think one should do, that's almost exactly the same. And it's in the 90s. Uh, and then what other what they think others uh, do and should be doing uh, think one should do uh, that's much lower so that's like between 60 and 70 percent so that's where the gap lies um, people's own behavior and their attitudes are pretty consistent with each other can I follow up on that um, <laughs> I, yeah I think I think part of what was what's going on here um, at least in the US but I, I think in other countries too is that there's a lot of media attention for the people who are not following the recommendations and uh, who are protesting mask use and 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 lockdowns and so on and uh, so so that leads to the perception that others aren't doing uh, what they should be doing and and Perhaps also when we walk on the street, we pay, pay more attention to the people who are not wearing masks than the people who are wearing masks. Um, but on our uh, national survey, uh, we find we do find differences. So, for example, uh, Republicans are uh, less willing to uh, are less likely to report mask use, but still a majority, even among Republicans, uh, are wearing masks. And so, but th that doesn't get attention. It's not newsworthy. And so we get the feeling that others aren't following um, recommendations and that perhaps especially Republicans are uh, not following recommendations, but the majority still is. And I think that's good news and something we need to emphasize because social norms do in, uh, inf inform people's behavior. And in, in terms of that observation, it, it, we, we do get information about social norms from, from multiple sources, right? From the media, from our leaders, from our own communities, but also by observation. And um, I don't know if anyone else has been traveling, but uh, obviously trying not to during this period. But in December, I did have to go to the UK. And one thing that really struck me from going from Manhattan, the middle of Manhattan, where about 90% of people are wearing masks in this area, and probably you will get funny looks if you are not wearing a mask, was going to the UK, to London, to Cambridge, and seeing 90% of people not wearing masks um, in public spaces outside. And I wondered, like, how do we change those norms if they are so so different in those places. And I'm sure there's many different places in the US people have commented to me about um, areas that have a lot of mask wearing and areas that do not. 
Well, I think several studies have shown that that uh, having a uh, mandate for mask use makes a big difference. So if you really want people to uh, wear masks and actually have social social norms play and risk perception play less of a role, uh, have, a, have a mandate because then people will wear it even if they don't think it's that necessary because they, they now have to. <laughs> but there has to be a willingness to do that. Yeah, mandates for sure. Alison? I don't know, I just put a comment in the chat that you don't have to fly all the way to the UK to see the, the non-masking. I think um, people have, who have you know, done some long drives in the US to avoid flying have commented that as soon as you cross the Appalachians, uh, you know, it, it looks different at gas stations, it looks different at motels, at restaurants. And there's that, that odd feeling of like, like where am I? Like I, I've, I, you know, the norm is so established in some places that it's actually quite startling to suddenly be in a place where people are, are like, it feels like living in a different reality. It certainly does. Um, and I, th I think this relates to some of the work, Wendy, that you were doing on whether, how people feel if they see other people getting vaccines and um, they don't feel that they're eligible how, how, what do we do about, um, how do we improve that? Um, well, so I, I think I gave, a, I gave a number of recommendations for that, but I think currently, I think the main issue is that it's very difficult to get the vaccine, at least in the US, it's very difficult to get a vaccine. You, it's not clear where, where they are available. If they are available, there's all these hurdles that you need to go over to, to, to get an appointment if you're eligible. Um, so currently that's the main issue. I think we need to prepare for the moment where uh, more people have been vaccinated and then we have to um, reach out to people who are vaccine hesitant. Currently, I think that's not the main issue. The main issue is that people who want to get the vaccine can't get it. Um, and uh, especially uh, uh, underserved, traditionally underserved communities are suffering the most because they don't have the time to figure out how to get an appointment, to stand in line for hours to get a vaccine. And um, so that should be the first thing to be addressed, but we should also start thinking about uh, reaching out to people who are vaccine hesitant and communicating with them, showing them that others are getting vaccinated, showing that these others are having mild or no side effects and, um, and sharing people's experiences um, about the vaccine. I think it's also really important as we start to see data, first we saw it for healthcare workers, now we're seeing it for other tiers, at least in the US. Um, you know, we see percent vaccinated and we assume that everybody else is hesitant or has refused. Um, so this is very true sort of within health systems for healthcare workers. And there may be a lot of other reasons that that 70% to say of black healthcare workers in a certain system haven't vaccinated. And a lot of those things are way easier to fix than changing someone's mind or changing someone's attitude. So, you know, back to Cass's talk this morning, making sure that it's easy. Have we, maybe we sent them an email and maybe they don't use their work email. Um, maybe they're not sure about whether they're allowed to take time off during a shift to go get the vaccine at the vaccine clinic. Um, so really, really careful sort of diagnosis about what the actual barriers are that people are facing before we leap to the, like, this group is hesitant or this group is refusing. Yeah. yeah. Completely yeah. agree. Absolutely. I would, love, I would love to just receive a call or a letter telling me, this is your appointment and, and go along to it rather than trying to click and get one. Um, there's a couple of comments about um, the impact on mental health. Um, Someone asked about um, men mental health after the lockdown, one of the panelists. Hand up. I think a couple of... Rick has his hand up for a while. Okay, Rick. Yeah, I have uh, a real quick question for Allison and maybe some of the others. So I'm, I'm, one, I'm in that researcher cluster. Uh, so how the heck do I get uh, our results out to the people for whom it might matter in a, in a very timely and very quick fashion? What are the outlets? How do I package things? Uh, what do I do? I mean, I know how to write a traditional academic article. I don't quite, I know how to write a blog. I don't quite know how to reach, uh, you know, practitioner communities. Any, any insights, thoughts? Uh, 
I, I'd love to hear from others too. I mean, I think there are, um, there are there's so many initiatives right now to again, compile these playbooks um, to do the translation and dissemination um, work to get this in the hands of, you know, everyone from CDC and HHS down to your local public health department. Um, some of that has to, has to be built on existing relationships. You know, hopefully you do have uh, partners um, in, in health systems and public health agencies and community-based organizations. Um, but I think we're also gonna see more initiatives to, um, you know, to, to develop these playbooks and you want your evidence in those playbooks. Um, so, you know, I think this kind of connection with, you know, with us today, with this researcher group um, and, and, and ongoing conversations will be really helpful. If others have like pragmatic suggestions for who needs to be seeing our stuff, um, it'd be great to speak up here or, or throw it in the chat. Let me say a radical thing. And that is if I was a policymaker, I'd run a thousand miles away from our stuff and I will include my own work there. We're beginning to do some basic work, but I'm deeply, deeply concerned about the behavioral welfare basis for many of the pronouncements that we're making about, we just had a discussion about how people might rationally, reasonably as good Bayesians not want to get vaccines. And yet we're saying, let's pound them, let's pound them, let's pound them. We've got to make them vaccines. We haven't thought through the basics of the behavioral welfare economics of what we're doing. So I think it's far more premature for us to sort of start saying, let's pump it out to, let's nudge policymakers to follow our advice. But that's just me. Um, if, if I just uh, may jump in, this is only for Germany, but I fear there is a lot of interest um, on a more um, upper level of policy making. But when it comes to the federal, um, you know, the local of policy makers, I think this is this is the real challenge, at, at least for Germany. There's a lot of um, decision power in, in very local places. And um, yeah, I think this is the, the very big challenge here. I mean, some of that can start with, uh, you know, letting them tell you the questions they have, um, you know, sort of co-designing some of these studies and, and research agendas with the frontline folks. We've been talking in Philadelphia and we are our own vaccine jurisdiction in the US. We're one of the 64 CDC jurisdictions. So what we do is totally separate from the rest of the state of Pennsylvania, which makes for some interesting decision making. But, um, you know, one of our goals is not 80% of the population gets vaccinated. It's every Philadelphian is reached with the opportunity to have a conversation and have the information they need to make the choice that is right for them. That is not an approach I've used in prior vaccine acceptance work for like parents vaccinating their kids. It's just like vaccinate your kid. Uh, but this is a different, it's a different vaccine. We're at a different moment in terms of, you know, awareness of structural racism and health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we just need to ask the folks on the ground what their goals are, what they're trying to optimize um, and, and design experiments and design policy recommendations to match that. And to add on that, I think what we're currently doing with how difficult it is to get vaccinated and, and the way it's being set up is that we're nudging people who want to get vaccinated away from getting vaccinated. So that's a nudge also and probably um, uh, and it's also undermining people's uh, um, uh, choice. Yes, and for those people that do want to get vac vaccinated, as you said, Wendy, if, if it is too difficult to do it, you know, then losing interest. But in terms of, um, like, should we, when we're having the discussion, Alison, you mentioned having a discussion with people, to what extent should those messages be tailored for different communities? I mean, they have to be, right? <laughs> like, it would be, it would be, you know, I don't think any of us here who do this kind of research would think that we can come up with the one message for, for everyone that's going to work, not only by uh, race, ethnic, or other sociodemographic characteristics, but as someone mentioned up thread, um, you know, cognitive and decision making characteristics. Um, you know, responding to where you are on the hesitancy. You know, we think about like the folks who are super gung ho and the folks who are hardcore anti-vax and we don't have to do much with either of those, but there's this movable middle um, and they have different needs and preferences. And yes, messaging has to be tailored and targeted to what they need to hear and, and what kind of movement um, we're hoping to get from them. So, so in terms of like the goal being that you want them to take the vaccine rather than presenting something very neutral, right? Can I say something? Uh, I think that Glenn's point was kind of, it's a different thread and I, and I, and I want to pick up on it. I already made the point that if you tell people that they're not going to be able to change their lives, you know, they, that sort of takes away one of the benefits of getting a vaccine. Uh, and it just, again, doesn't seem to align with reality, which might be useful. 
to align ourselves with. Um, but I also think that there is uh, this concern about rationalizing kind of non-compliance. I don't think, so I'm, I'm like, I have my appointment, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I'm not trying to say, uh, I'm not trying to nudge against that, but there's a, a couple of things. One, Dr. Fauci was at Washington University doing rounds and uh, I got to see that. And he kind of let out this, this interesting fact that um, a lot of the adverse side effects are, uh, are gonna come out after 45 to 90 days. If I'm a healthcare worker, that, may, that might be a reason I'm gonna wait 45 or 90 days to see what happened. That seems uh, very rational. Uh, also, you know, think about times doctors have been wrong in the past. I mean, for a while, you know, you can't eat fat, then you can't eat sugar. And I think we're back to you can't eat fat again. I don't remember where. And this is because of, you know, payments made to Harvard professors, uh, uh, you know, by the cereal industry or whatever it was. What percentage do you need to place on the possibility that all the autism stuff is true to rationalize not vaccinating your kids? I don't think it's like 90. I'm imagining it's probably really low because if there's herd immunity, especially, there's it's not gonna really probably affect you, but there's some tiny percentage chance that doctors are absolutely wrong, have been all wrong all along. And so why bother getting vaccinated? I think these are the kinds of things we should be thinking about a little bit, uh, uh, maybe as part of the nudges, but also maybe as part of not the nudges. And that's particularly true, you know, when you think about MMR, you know, most parents in the US have never seen a case of measles. Most of their pediatricians have never seen a case of measles. So it's really easy to assume that that's not a dangerous disease, that my kid is not at risk for that. Whereas if I have any, if I have any non-zero, you know, assumption of risk for something, a bad outcome on the vaccine, then that's an easy trade-off. We don't have that with COVID, right? Like almost, basically everybody has seen, um, you know, the detrimental effects of, of this disease, whether personally or in families or in networks. So- Well, they've also we seen um, a lot of positive effects, right? They've also seen that lots and lots of people got it and then didn't get sick. So, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking that a vaccine is gonna make you grow a tail, you might take that bet, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know how bizarre, like behavioral your preferences need to be to land on like uh, not, not, not getting a vaccine. And I think that, you know, maybe it's worth writing a model to, to show that I, I haven't, but I, I, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't think you have to be completely nuts right now to not want a vaccine. And I think that's- Or not want it yet. Right, not want it yet at this point. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Let me maybe pick up- I think this really uh, jumps into sort of, you know, ethical issues, right? Philosophical questions about how much we should be nudging right? and to what extent, right to the extreme of should we be making the vaccine mandatory for certain people? Should we make it mandatory for children if they want to go to school? Um, those, those kind of issues are, are going to become more important as, as time goes on. I agree, and that was certainly the issue that I started with, but I want to just pick up on the point that Nicholas was saying, um, and it's a technical point, and it's one of some, some significance because a lot of us are doing work on beliefs and risk perceptions. And one of the critical things that recent literature, both in psych and in economics has been concerned with is not just eliciting the point estimate of someone's belief, but the confidence. One of the things that we believe a priori is that there's massive lack of confidence. So pick up, pick up Nicholas's point about, you know, MMR and autism from, um, uh, and the rest. you may have a very small point estimate, but if you allow some tail, larger distribution slide out, then it can rationally, at least given your subjective beliefs, affect your choices. We need to understand those structures. And if we keep eliciting through surveys or experiments, uh, beliefs that are just the point estimate, we're completely, totally missing the uncertainty that people have, even if those point estimates are small or large. And so it's very easy to write out the sort of model Nicholas was asking for as a Bayesian, where these distributions slide into domains where people will rationally, given their subjective beliefs, make those decisions. We're just starting to understand those sorts of confidence issues about beliefs. Uh, so we're way a ways, in my view, that's why I think we're a ways from making policy pronouncements. We're just not ready for prime time. But when it comes to the um, disease itself, there's also so much ambiguity, right? I mean, now we talk a lot about potential risk with the vaccine and so on. But for example, Germany still claims there's that many people who have healthy uh, survived this disease. Um, and now we know that uh, many of them actually who were in hospital, I think uh, one in eight 
who were treated in hospital die in the next half year. But we don't know that from German data, but from data from other European countries, because you know, and it seems that many countries don't even track that like Germany. Yeah, so I feel oh, there's a very biased perception of that. Um, and, and we don't know what happens in 10 years, right? I mean, you can have a measles infection and 10 years later, you get a bad infection in your brain from it. Yeah. Your hands, yeah, your hands up, yeah. I have a weird habit of not unmuting myself. I would just wanted to briefly clarify Nicholas's point. Like you, you were saying, Nicholas, that it's you don't have to be nuts to not want to get a vaccine. And it seems to me that if you're familiar with the evidence, you kind of do have to be nuts. And the the two comparisons are precisely problematic because there was a randomized controlled trial or several for these vaccines. And there wasn't for the Wakefield MMR paper that was based on a story told about 12 kids. And it's really hard to do uh, trials about fat and salt intake. And so it seems to me that I can see a story there about like scientific illiteracy being really a problem that we need to address. But it, I think it'd be problematic if we got into the business on this panel to somehow equivocate between these very different situations, like the evidence behind these vaccines is vastly different from uh, anything that can be said for salt, fat, or the MMR vaccine, right? Or like the, the evidence against the MMR vaccine. Yeah, I mean, I guess oh, I the what we mean by that. an example of the fact that you could have large uncertainty. I, I completely agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and I mean, the question is also like, what do I mean by nuts beliefs? I mean, I, I, I think Glenn said it correctly, where he said, rational, conditional on your subjective beliefs, and you know, where does subjective right, right. Beliefs come from, right? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah good. We understood each other. Is important. It is an important point, right? So, uh, so personally, I am going to go get a trial because or a vaccine because I read this. But I, what I'm yeah. saying is that. I don't have to imagine. I don't have to think that it's a tree-hugging sort of anti-vaxxer who's sort of a bizarre, uh, a, yeah. a, an extreme. I, I yeah. can see where there's some hesitancy in the middle. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, and if I may jump in really quickly, I think this is a very important discussion. Like, for example, uh, some news from Italy. On some people are saying, I don't want the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine because the efficacy is lower than you know. I want the Pfizer vaccine, or vaccine, or the Moderna vaccine. Um, so what's the problem there? I, I would get any, you know, if I could get it today, the AstraZeneca, I would get it. But so what's causing this? Too much information or uh, uh, I don't think that's the case. But so uh, uh, mis I, don't, I don't even think it's misinformation, but it's maybe the wrong way of, uh, of, of conveying information. What do the panelists uh, uh, think? This is going to be huge, especially with the Johnson & Johnson results, the Janssen results. You know, we already have communities in the U.S. saying, you know, we don't want it. We have communities saying, if you send it to us, you're sending it to us because it's the poorer performing vaccine and we're the poorer people. Um, on the other hand, like it, it does, a, it's a great vaccine. We've just anchored on these like, you know, blockbuster vaccines with 95% efficacy. Um, and if we get to the point where individuals, especially privileged individuals are thinking, this is something where I'm supposed to make a choice, like privileged parents thinking they have to design their kids' vaccine schedules, we're gonna be in trouble. Like this is not ask for it by name. This is what is your physician offering you right now and, and get it in your arm. And it's only gonna get worse as we have more wonderful vaccines in the program. I think that issue, if I may, is also going to be extremely serious when we start looking at the global perspective. And that is that we're facing a massive public bad issue now where if vaccines don't go to say sub-Saharan Africa, we have this massive Petri dish, tragically, that's going to be generating mutations. I'm using that, I'm overstating that case, but I think we have this very, very significant global problem that is being completely glossed by all of the discussion. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's one that I would worry deeply about because I don't see ways to solve that. Thank you. I just, um, we have, a, have about 10 minutes left and we've spoken a lot about vaccines and I just want to broaden the discussion a little bit more in terms of how can we improve our responses. So um, as I mentioned before, there's a couple of comments about 
what about the mental health pandemic? What can we do about that? Um, with uh, you know, and balancing that with that, uh, somebody asked about how does mental how is mental health affected by lockdowns and other mandates that have come into place. So I'd love to hear from some of the panelists about that. Yeah, so we we have been tracking mental health uh, in the pandemic since um, March 2020, and uh, for overall in the U.S., um, uh, the there was a. Uh, negative effect to, or a negative uh, turn in mental health, uh, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, groups, a lot of people, uh, so on average, people have re rebounded to um, uh, feeling relatively better, perhaps found a way to live with this pandemic. But the pandemic is hard for a specific groups. So for example, young people are having a harder time than older people perhaps when you're because when you're young that's the time you're not supposed to be stuck at home with your parents and go out and have fun and um so young people are having a harder time of course people who have had have experienced job losses and having uh, economic problems are, are are having worse mental health and so i think we should think about interventions to reach out to those groups I think also it's important to recognize that a lot of the work that's been done of necessity given the constraints are using extremely short form surveys of mental health and that as a lot of some of the evidence that I've seen in very specific uh, populations to be sure suggests that if you ask if you start looking at the full range of DSM categories in very very rich detail you're seeing serious serious problems that are buried under God forbid a happiness question, but I, nobody does those anymore. But there are these very, very simplistic questions about mental health that I think are perhaps hiding uh, structural components that are deeply serious and long-term. So I think that's needs great, great, great research. That said, that's true, but a lot of uh, mental uh, d doctors' offices use four question mental health screeners to start conversations about mental health, and you can use those in surveys as well. Yeah, with massive biases, but that's another discussion, right? And Wendy, you mentioned interventions for younger people. Can you describe any of these? Uh, so, yeah, no, I have not seen specific interventions uh, uh, to help younger people, but I, uh, or at least not evaluated interventions. But I've heard, for example, of countries where um, they've uh, tried to implement efforts to involve younger young people in, um, for example, food delivery um, so that they, the young people can get out of the house away from the parents and uh, do something good for others, which tends to be uh, beneficial to mental health. Um, so, and, and uh, so there's, there's, there's things like that uh, to get young people involved in the pandemic response might be a good idea. And then for people who have lost their jobs, I think um, 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 helping them out with uh, economic support and uh, food assistance programs might be a good idea. And um, uh, some countries are better at that than others. I think in the US too, for mental health, for education outcomes, for kids, for economic activity, we really lost control of the narrative and, and we got this false trade off, right? We can either, you know, mitigate the virus or we can have these, um, you know, these other outcomes. And, you know, the answer is like, you have to control the virus. Like you don't, you don't, they're not, it, it, they're not, they're not equivalent and it's, and it's a false trade off. And we completely, you know, back in about April, uh, lost the ability to have, have a, a good policy conversation about that. Yes, so there's many, many things that we could do, do better next time. What can we learn from, um, what can we learn from other uh, epidemics and how other countries have managed this? Yeah, I was really intrigued to hear more about uh, using HIV as a, as a example for, Nicholas, is, do you have work on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to uh, uh, just briefly de describe it. I mean, the I'd, I'd done work earlier that looks at why um, people don't, who are HIV positive, don't always use life-saving drugs. And uh, was able, and, in the, and this is a US context. And so it wasn't price or cost, it was, uh, I made an argument that it was side effects that interact with the ability to work. 
And so kind of building off of that, uh, I'm just looking at different education groups because uh, I have good data on that particular dimension of heterogeneity. And we do indeed find that there's, there's a difference and it might have to do with kind of the sorts of occupations that low education people sort into that they're less able to work uh, uh, and also sort of manage their side effects. So they're more physical, less flexible um, occupations. So that's kind of, uh, I think, a little bit analogous here because there's not only, you know, this, this, this own health thing, you know, you want to be on the best drugs possible, uh, but there's also uh, a positive externality. So these, these, these medications repress, you know, the virus, which makes people less infectious. So you want as many people on them as you can from a societal standpoint. Uh, and this question's moot for HIV uh, because uh, medications have very few side effects now. I'm so I use data from kind of in the beginning of these drugs when they were very effective and had massive side effects. So in like the mid to late 90s uh, into the early 2000s. Uh, and we're able to, so we build up kind of a structural model with that's dynamic and people are thinking of, you know, jointly making decisions about medication use and uh, their, their labor supply. And um, we can then use that to kind of play with policy. And we uh, show, for example, you know, what happens if I pay people uh, some amount that looks like the amount that people were paid to stay out of work with COVID. And not surprisingly, you find people uh, working less uh, because you're paying them to not work. But you also find that there's going to be differences in their use of medication once they're not no longer needing to work. And this is concentrated among people who were fairly healthy, so they weren't kind of in, in the disaster zone yet, so they weren't using the medications, and also um, among low education people who are the ones for whom this 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 kind of side effect work effect is much stronger. So um, that's, I think, the general lesson that we're trying to to put out, and that I think has some uh, bearing on what we're thinking about here. That there is this real trade off, and it's stronger for certain groups of people. If I just add, add to that, that um, I feel there was many developed countries that somehow lacked experience with pandemics and taking it seriously, you know, at least in Germany, even if it was already present in Italy, it was like, okay, but there's one country in between and this will never reach us. Yeah, this was not only when it was in China, but really like way on, people were just trying to ignore this completely while... Uh, uh, I guess other countries uh, who were experienced with that from swine flu or SARS-1 or whatever, I mean, they just had a much faster reaction and mask wearing was something more natural and so on. So my hunch would be the next pandemic, um, at least we will take it seriously and not try to ignore it. Or at least that's my hope. <laughs> I hope you're right. I um, was on a panel on uh, pandemics uh, in 2006 in uh, where I um, I'm a psychologist, so I don't naturally know I've been trained in epi in pandemics, but I learned on that panel uh, of what epidemiologists were predicted predicting what would happen with a pandemic. And so I, as a, a psychologist who is not trained in pandemic, just from being on that panel, learned that. Uh, I, I predicted what was going to happen <laughs> with, with COVID. I, I saw it coming and I think the US pandemic response team probably would have known that it was coming and uh, other epidemiolo and epidemiologists were seeing it coming. It's just that our leaders didn't listen to these epidemiologists necessarily. And I'm not sure that they will next time. I'm sorry to be a downer here. But there seems to be this experience utility thing, right? That if you... Yeah. There's some yeah. knowledge in the society this helps. So that would be my hope that next time well, we wake up faster. Wendy, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than you, right? That we have to learn from these failures and recent experience, there was an effect of that of, of, from the countries. So I'm hopeful. Um, I don't think you are. <laughs> I hope you're right. So uh, we only have a couple of minutes and I would love to get some just last minute thoughts from each of our panelists. So, um, Wendy, can we start with you? I'm sorry, what's the question? Just your last minute thoughts, like some takeaways on how to improve our response for next time, particularly because you're pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should worry about the current time because we're not done yet. And uh, so uh, I think uh, behavioral economics, psychology uh, can help to understand uh, people's beliefs and behaviors and to develop policies that uh, 
um, can uh, help to stop the pandemic. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I'll just repeat myself because, you know, maybe it'll get out into the world, just that I, I hope that kind of health wealth trade-offs at the societal and individual level are brought into the, the, uh, the discussion. I think it'll help uh, if uh, not only to better predict how things are going to play out, but also I think there's a lot of people who will feel heard and therefore maybe more willing to uh, comply if, if they think that we're taking their needs seriously. And that would require epidemiologists and economists to actually like continue to talk after this is done. Thanks. Johannes? Um, I'd love for people in this group and elsewhere to work on the question why there's so much hesitancy to engage in controlled experimentation. We're running huge uncontrolled experiments with all these interventions and nobody wants to run the controlled experiment and I don't understand why. And if we could solve that, I think that'd be really great. Alison. I guess just a plea to us as researchers to pay attention to invest in this question of translation and dissemination and partnering with policy and, and practitioners building on what Johannes said. Um, make sure we're asking and answering the questions they have and that we're, even if it takes a lot of packaging and simplification, whatever, let's get our science um, into, the, into the pipeline for implementation and experimentation. Otherwise, we're not like, why are we doing it? Great. Well, we have a lot to learn, but we've still got a lot of work left to do. And I, I just want to thank uh, all the panelists for their time today and their expertise. Um, very informative. So thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you so much. This was really um, exciting, high energy and, and, and informative. Thanks again to all of the panelists. Thanks to all of the participants who spoke today, to the attendees for their comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we're going to end uh, the first half of, of this conference now. We have uh, our second half next Friday, 8.30 a.m. We uh, hope to see everyone uh, uh, then. Until then, thanks again, um, and uh, be safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Stay well, all. Thank you so much. Bye.